Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and I'd like to welcome you to the kickoff of our three-part mega event on vaccination certificates and identity management. Today's episode will be a thought-provoking policy roundtable, which will be followed by two episodes dedicated to what we are calling the Survey of Innovations, which includes presentations of national level initiatives on April 29th and May 6th. The interest in this topic is unprecedented, and this is understandable, given how critical it is for countries around the world to adopt effective measures for safely reopening their borders and relaunching their economies. Many countries have already begun implementing COVID passport schemes, and the topic continues to dominate the mass media and stir controversy. From the outset, I like to emphasize that ID for Africa is neither for nor against such schemes. Our objective in putting together this month long series of live casts is to inform responsible public policy by getting a multi perspective view on the issues and concerns, and by exploring subsequently the range of technologies and innovations that are available for if and when countries decide to put in practice these policies. Speaking of innovations, we have received 75 high quality proposals to participate in the survey sessions from which we have selected 20. Before I unveil the retained submissions, I'd like to emphasize that per our policy for the live cast, no financial or other consideration was received from any of the chosen participants. The selection was made through a merit-based review of proposals in response to a global call for participation. Furthermore, selection to participate should not be interpreted as an endorsement by ID for Africa. We remain vendor and technology neutral and equal opportunity for all. Here is the selection grouped by the two dates. These represent 20 innovations and national initiatives from 12 countries around the world. Um, we will have one group on the 29th of April, and then we will continue the session and the survey on May 6. I want to thank everybody who has submitted, and I'm sorry that we could only accommodate 20. Those represent good proposals well presented, but are not necessarily the only good ideas. I'm sure among the remaining 55, there are still several promising innovations, but unfortunately, they were not as well documented relative to the others. One more item before we start today. I'd like to remind you that the call for participation on identity for democracy is still open. The session is scheduled for May 26, so please submit as soon as possible. The deadline is rapidly approaching. It's April 26. This is really another critical topic pertinent for our times. Okay, back to today's event. Today, we gather here in this live cast at an unprecedented moment in time. Never in our recent memory has the world faced a crisis of this magnitude, a crisis against which no country is immune, African nations included. We're coming together at a point when once again, it is becoming clear that identity will need to play an important role in helping solve universal problem, like it had done many times before. The last 20 years have successively demonstrated the clear value proposition of identity across many domains, starting with the national security in the aftermath of 9-11, which during the decade of the 2000s led to wide adoption of biometrics and the entrenchment of a secure credential that is now issued by more than 150 countries around the world, namely the e-passport. We have then seen it play a very important role in development throughout the last decade with the success of India's Adhar, the birth of ID for Africa, and the proliferation of ID for D programs around the world with heavy concentration on Africa. Then with the advent of the decade of the 2020s, we're now seeing an acceleration for digital identity in public health and in the digital economy not just in the development context, but across every country in the world, no matter what their income level is. This time, it appears the world is clamoring for a new secure credential to help it manage the COVID crisis and return to acceptable norms of human and economic activities. The frenzy that we are seeing reminds me of what we saw in the immediate aftermath of September 11, 2001, when terrorism was the major preoccupation. 
But unlike the situation back then, this time around, the nature of the demand is fundamentally different. For one thing, the scope of the problem is universal and the number of people likely to be impacted by whatever ends up being adopted is orders of magnitude bigger. Also, we're now entering into a territory that can evoke serious ethical concerns. All things considered, while it is good to plan and anticipate, we urge the authorities to be cautious before launching their schemes to ensure that in the current haste, we do not end up injuring human values or aggravate patterns of inequity that our development community has been fighting against for decades. Already, the situation with access to vaccines raises inequity concerns and puts the African continent, for example, at a disadvantage. While our sessions for the next three episodes are global in their scope, we will keep an eye on the impact on Africa, which has no choice but to go along with what the world will impose if it is to avoid being isolated from the global community. Till this day, 20 years later, Africa is still catching up with the introduction of e-passports required for global travel. As a sidebar, during this live cast, we will use the term COVID passports to refer both vaccination and certificates and COVID test certificates, except where we need to make a distinction between, between the two. So why is the current situation more problematic than what we have dealt with before? Putting the gigantic scope and potential negative impact aside, as we shall see today, world authorities are making policy decisions as we speak, while critical scientific evidence about vaccination efficacy and the link to immunity continues to be lacking. Add to that the enormous potential for function creep from the get-go due to the strong temptation to use COVID passports for every aspect of daily life and not just essential activities. And we end up with a subject fraught with danger, one where actions could impact certain human values and rights, absent ethical and legal guardrails. Just scan through the mass media and you will see how wide and deep COVID passports have reached into the collective mindshare and what kind of opinion divide they're now leading to around the world. While at this stage, many things are still not clear in this debate, one thing is rapidly becoming clear. Some form of a COVID passport is here to stay somewhere and for some things. So despite legitimate resistance, it behooves us to anticipate and plan for the scenario where COVID passports turn out to be needed, not only to get out of the crisis, but to manage it as the pandemic becomes endemic. We have the interest to make sure that whatever the world ends up with is fit for purpose, just like we did with the e-passport. The global identity community is well placed to intervene and provide guidance on coordinated approaches for the development and deployment of such credentials and to ensure that they follow well-established principles for interoperability, good governance, and inclusion. Some of these principles have been recently revisited in the newly published Principles for Identification for Sustainable Development. To explore the topic of COVID passports and identity management, we've assembled an amazing panel of front, frontline practitioners representing the leading organizations directly involved in policy and standards. Before we welcome the panel, I'd like to remind the audience that you can participate in three ways. There's the chat, there's Q&A, and there's community voices. But please put your questions into the Q&A and not the chat if you're looking for the panel to address them. Also, when you ask a question, please remember to direct it to the panelists you like to answer or to all. It would be helpful also to put your name and organization in there as well. Of course, you can chat with each other and, and network and make sure you set up the chat to all, not just to the panelists. That's, that's a feature uh, which is not by default. By default, it's only to the panelists. So please remember to chat with everybody. Also be on the lookout for digital goodies, which are links to useful content that accompany some of the panelists' contributions. And if you want to join the panel, please press the raise your hand button on Zoom when we invite community voices. Please be responsive and keep monitoring as an operator would need to contact you to elevate you to the panel. We prefer participation with video on. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode and found it informative, please give us a thumbs up on YouTube, share with others and subscribe. Now we're ready to welcome the panel. With us today and in no particular order are Nat, Ratana Prayul from the World Health Organization, Derek Munin from the World Health Organization as well. I'm not sure if Derek has, has arrived. He was on a flight, but he should be joining us. Louis Cole from IATA, 
Dr. Nargis Abdennabi from IKO is unable to join us today, so she's replaced by Dr. Karen Carolan from IKO, Florian Forster from IOM, Raj Rajesh Kumar from ISO Working Group 3, Dr. Edgar Whitley from London School of Economics, Alan Gelb from the Center for Global Development, and Jerry Springall from CETA. Thank you to all the panelists for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks also go to our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Omidyar Network for their support in making our live casts possible. Today, this live cast will be conducted in seven chapters or scenes with different actors visible on the screen in different scenes. The first scene is going to be our opening scene where everybody is on the screen. And I'd like to ask one question to all the panelists and who will answer it in order. And the question is, can you please tell us what is your or your organization's link or involvement in the topic of COVID vaccine or COVID passports? I will start with Nat from who? Hi everyone, my name is Nat Nachitaya Ratanapriol from the World Health Organization. I'm a technical officer in the Digital Health and Innovations Department and I'm helping coordinate the Smart Vaccination Certificate Working Group, um, which is essentially a global working group that um, has consolidated a bunch of experts to come up with standards and guidance for member states to deploy um, and implement a standards-based vaccine certificate in accordance to health content guidelines from WHO. Of course, WHO does a lot of other work in regards to the policy aspects as well in terms of providing guidance to member states for travel-based, um, risk-based recommendations for cross-border travel, among other things. Um, but my role specifically just for the vaccine certificate work, so great to meet you all. Okay, actually, um, Dr. Karen. Yes, hello to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Karen Carolyn. I'm the officer responsible for the IKO Public Key Directory, which uh, provides me a strong insight and involvement in work on the electronic passport generally. Uh, I'm from ICAO, as I say, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the United Nations Agency responsible for international civil aviation. And our role in vaccination certificates and health certificates, more generally COVID passports, we'll call them in this session, uh, is probably twofold. One is the fact that aviation has been impacted very, very significantly. The word Dr. Attic said is unprecedented by uh, an unprecedented crisis for aviation, COVID-19. And as a result, IKO has been tasked with providing some kind of solutions. And in that regard, health proofs, COVID passports have been identified as a potential vehicle to provide an element of the solution to, to drive aviation recovery. And by driving an aviation recovery, trying to stimulate some of the concomitant uh, impacts related to social development and economic development. So ICAO is, uh, is working hard at that. And secondly, it was already mentioned into it in the introduction, the fact that the passport is probably the most fundamental uh, secure credential used internationally today. And ICAO is the holder of the passport standard. And we're using that knowledge and experience to try to support the development of the COVID passport now as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, I go to Louise Cole, Ayata. Hi, thank you, Dr. Attic. It's written lovely to be speaking again at our ID for Africa event. Uh, I just wish we were all together and, and not via this uh, amazing technology, but still not quite the same as all being together. So thank you. And that leads in nicely to uh, introduce myself as Louise Cole, the uh, implementation manager for the IR to travel pass and our uh, intent is to to be able to provide something as the industry association for airlines we know there's a really clear need to provide governments travelers industry stakeholders with the digital solutions that are there to address the challenges that COVID, the COVID pandemic has brought. And as Karen has rightly pointed out, the impacts on the, on the aviation sector are um, unprecedented. Um, we know uh, that we need to put in place things for our members and for travellers and for governments to be able to contribute to the safe and efficient reopening of borders with the IATA Travel Pass. Thank you. We're going to hear a lot more about these initiatives uh, next. Uh, Dr. Edgar Whitley. Hi, uh, 
have. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm Edgar Whitley. I'm an academic at the London School of Economics uh, in the UK. I've been studying digital identity systems over the past uh, 15 or so years, and I'm co-chair of the Privacy and Consumer Advisory Group to the UK's digital identity uh, scheme. I am here on this panel particularly because I was also involved in a number of reports by the Ada Lovelace Institute uh, in the UK, uh, one looking at the role of technology and the coronavirus pandemic, and then more recently a rapid evidence review that was looking at the place that COVID passports would have uh, in society, so not just looking at international uh, travel but also potentially for domestic use. And if you've been following the news about the UK, uh, our thinking around domestic use of COVID status documents is a little bit confused at the moment, shall we say. We'll come back to that. Thanks, thanks, Edgar. Uh, Florian? Hello, my name is Florian Forster. I'm the head of immigration and border management at the IOM, the international organization the UN Migration Agency. We work on migration, but also more generally on cross-border human mobility. Uh, IOM is not a norm-setting organization, but we are very closely involved in working groups led by WHO, uh, by ICAO, where we participate and bring in our knowledge. We are concerned with all three types of borders, air border, sea border, and land border. We work in all those areas. And our main work consists on you know, helping migrants uh, very much affected by the current crisis and helping our member states to cope and to roll out maybe new technologies and, and, and set up the necessary mechanisms to respond to the COVID-19 crisis and the huge impact it has on migrants and mobile populations worldwide. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Jeremy Springall. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Vice President and CETA responsible for our border management business. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with CETA, um, we're an IT solutions provider uh, focused pr predominantly on the air transport industry and we serve airports, airlines and governments around uh, cross-border travel. Um, we're owned by the air transport industry. And a core part of what we do is enable industry-wide collaboration, so which is a key part of what we're talking about here today. Um, and therefore, since the, really from the start of the pandemic, we've been working with the uh, aviation and the travel industry, as well as governments. Firstly, look at how governments can control their borders and obviously restrict um, the spread of the virus. And now, obviously, importantly, we're now looking at how we can restart travel um, by reopening borders um, with confidence by integrating digital certificates and health passes within the existing aviation and border processes that exist today. Um, I think importantly for me, um, the key element that I'd like to focus on is how we can move from a situation today where we're doing some very small trials around travel certificates and passes to really how we can rapidly move to um, implement these solutions at scale on a global level uh, or at least on a regional level um, uh, around the world and enable safe and seamless travel for all of us as quickly as we can so we can recover from the, uh, uh, the pandemic. And we'll come back to that, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, Raj? Thank you, Dr. Akit, for having me. Uh, my name is Rajesh Kumar. Um, I run a small company in Singapore called Optorizium Private Limited, uh, focusing on e-passport PKI and e-passport validation. Uh, but I also represent Singapore in ISO SC17 Working Group 3, which is the ISO body that sets the standards for travel documents. Uh, within Working Group 3, I am the chair of Task Force 5, which looks at everything that is related to the chip in the passport, and also wrote the specifications for the visible digital seal. Uh, currently, I am writing the specifications that uh, Kiran first talked about for IKO in terms of the digital health passports and the vaccine certificates. Thank you. Excellent. And we're going to get into the details in the next scene. Uh, Alan? Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here, Joseph. 
Uh, my name is Alan Gelb, and I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. We're a think tank, and we've had a work program for some time on identity and development, digital ID systems and development. We've worked closely with a number of other organizations, including the World Bank in the development of the principles, and of course, with ID for Africa. And our main interest is in the practicalities, the use of these systems, the rollout of the systems, how they may facilitate certain services, whether social grants or uh, um, other services, uh, health, uh, financial access, and how also they have the potential to exclude and the risks involved. Uh, international mobility uh, is a very important topic for many developing countries, including in Africa. Uh, some countries have been very hard hit by the decline in tourism, for example. So this topic is of a great interest to us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And, and again, this is just introducing the panelists and what they are doing. Um, we will be putting up digital goodies related to um, every panelist and every initiative. Uh, we do have uh, with us Derek Munin from the WHO. Uh, Derek, um, if you want to add in something briefly uh, about what your involvement with the topic. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Joseph and fellow panelists including uh, viewers and participants, just to double check uh, that you can hear me or co correctly. We can hear you. Thank you so much. So my name is Derek Munene. I work with the World Health Organization. Um, I'm the unit head for uh, a unit called Capacity Building and Collaboration. I spent last four years working within the regional office for Africa as the regional coordinator for M Health and E Health Services. Uh, and then within the uh, HQ, I lead a team focused really on capacity building and collaboration. I've been part of the group um, that's working on the uh, uh, smart vaccination certificate standards, but at the same time, been coordinating as well as with other teams around uh, the global strategy and making sure that we are supporting member states to plug in these digital investments within the broader agenda of digitalization and thereby avoiding verticalization. So pleased to be on this panel uh, and pleased to see a number of member states from the African continent. I uh, hope to we'll actually have a good discussion. Bonjour tout le monde, je suis Derek Munene. I thought I should speak a bit of French on this panel. <laughs> Il y a la traduction simultanée aussi. Alors, uh, ce n'est pas un problème. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, we want to pick up some momentum, but before we do that and go to the next scene, I want to do some sort of baseline setting. There, I mentioned in my, my brief uh, introduction that there were certain known unknowns that impact policy. We're not going to discuss them in detail. I'm just going to put them on the screen and ask uh, the panelists if we missed anything. And also, we're going to put them in the chat. And if anybody's aware of certain unknowns that we have missed, please add them to the chat. And the unknowns basically, clearly as these become known, the policies are gonna be changed, are gonna be evolved. We got these from discussions with the World Health Organization, US CDC, the European CDC, European Medical Association. So in a way they are available for everybody, but we thought we'd just put them in one place. Uh, we don't know the efficacy in limiting transmission. We don't know the impact of vaccine types. We don't know the effectiveness against variants. We don't know the duration of immunity. We don't know what you need for in terms of a booster. We don't know what happens with asymptomatic infections, the timing, how long do you have to wait? Everybody says two weeks, is this correct? Is there science behind it? Antibodies, there are people who are recovering. Um, do we use them as an indicator of immunity? Um, and et cetera, et cetera. So any of, anyone on the panel would like to um, give any color or add to this before I move on to the next slide. This is just level setting and background setting. Okay, so one more slide of level setting and terminology. Uh, already you've seen, uh, we've talked about it in, in the introductions. Actually, there are three types of credentials that are really covered in our discussion today. There are vaccination certificates, which attest to vaccination status, whether you've been vaccinated or not vaccinated. There are also COVID test certificates. Um, so you've got PCR and antigen, uh, which attest that you're COVID free at the time of the test or infected. And then recovery certificates, antibody tests, presence of antibodies. 
Um, some initiatives cover only one, some initiatives cover two, some initiatives cover three. So we thought we just put them out there, we put them in the chat so that you know what the terminology is. But when we say COVID passport, we really mean all of them. Okay, uh, one, one last uh, level setting. We're gonna run a very, very quick poll, just, just a quick poll. We're going to ask just to see, we have a community now over 400 people uh, online. So uh, can you uh, run this poll quickly, operator? And the question is, have you already been vaccinated for COVID at least one dose? Just I wanna, we wanna know what, what, is, what are we dealing with? Are we, and, and we have 140 countries here represented. So can you please launch the, the poll? Okay. We are, um, okay, I, I think we'll stop it here. And what I'm seeing is 71% um, has said no, and 29% has said yes. So we really are dealing with a situation where majority, the, the great majority, even professional people have not yet gotten vaccinated. Again, this is not a political commentary. This is just level setting. Okay, um, now we, we need to move on to the next scene. Um, and in that, I'd like to ask the operator to keep WHO, NAT, IKO, ISO, and IATA. And then um, we're gonna focus on initiatives serving primary needs to get, get into more detail on what they're doing. So for the rest of the panelists, please take a, take a sidebar and we'll come back to you. Okay, I will start, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll start with Nat from WHO. Uh, Nat, I'd like you to describe in detail your initiative, its objectives, the output, the stakeholders, um, but don't get into the details of the trust model or the link to identity. We'll address that in a later chapter. But uh, the floor is yours and explain to us what is the SMART vaccination certificate initiative about. Sure, so the SMART vaccination certificate um, working group is really just focused on the vaccination certificate. Um, as WHO, we currently do not recommend COVID-19 passports. Um, so in terms of using test certificates or immunities, previous infection or so-called immunity certificates, those are not within our scope. It's really about capturing the vaccination status of an individual. Um, I think another thing to note that as WHO, we really want to strongly assert that vaccine certificates are really about capturing a medical, it's capturing vaccination status. So it's tantamount to a medical document, not an identity document. So we actually really don't like the term passport because it implies some sort of identification linked to it, which is not the case. Um, we don't think that people should have to require identity to receive a vaccine nor have access to their own medical records. Um, so I just wanted to put that level setting there as well. Um, so the Smart Vaccination Certificate Working Group is really a group of experts that have um, experience and a, a lot of stakeholders as well in terms of determining standards for digital certificates for, med for medical records. Um, and it's really part of an extension of the existing work of WHO whereby we do currently have guidance on home-based records for childhood vaccinations, as well as, as I think everyone on this call is probably very acutely aware of the international health regulations, which specifies what data needs to be on the international certificate of vaccination or prophylaxis, which is the yellow card. So as we're moving both of these things that we combine call them vaccination certificates to the digital space, we're hoping to issue guidance for member states to be able to implement them on their own, as well as create something that is interoperable at the global level. Um, we're not adhering to any specific software or solution or anything like that. It's really about setting standards and making sure that member states have the correct guidance in terms of health content and being led by the health content and that the technology should meet the needs of the health program area. Um, the various stakeholders include people like ICAO, IATSA, ISO, those on this panel actually, in addition to others um, that include member state representatives, people who are responsible for implementing such systems within their own countries, as well as immunizations experts within all levels of WHO, so HQ level, regional office level, and country office levels. And so it's a large coordination um, effort 
within WHO, within digital health, as well as immunizations, as well as um, the health emergencies and response teams um, to set standards and guidance for member states in that regard. So, um, uh, can you describe the status? I know you published um, the first sure. version. Could you please tell us where it is? We'll, we're, going to, we're going to put it in the sure. digital goodies links. Please describe that. Yeah, so I think um, if people are familiar with WHO guidelines, it usually is a very long and thought out process followed by systematic reviews, expert panels, um, and the like. However, given the pandemic situation, we're really trying to rapidly get something out as soon as possible. Um, so we have this mechanism where we're calling each release a release candidate. Those who are in the software development um, space, I think are familiar with the term release candidate. So we have a release candidate one um, that has been published on March 19th. It's currently open for public comment um, until April 12th. So please do submit your feedback through that public feedback form. Um, and we'll be using these inputs to have a release candidate two, which is planned for end of April, and then a release candidate three by the end of May, and then a final kind of version one by the end of June, noting that um, there will obviously need to be updates as we go along as countries start implementing these systems, but it'll be on a much less rapid um, time scale. So these release candidates aren't complete guidance documents yet. I think that's the one thing to note is that it's really about getting the information out as soon as we can to member states so that they can start planning, they can start adjusting their existing systems um, because these things aren't just about the technology, it's really about the policy as well. Um, and so even within um, the emergency committee and the international health regulations group, they'll be meeting again next week um, to have some key policy decisions and recommendations. And so we're constantly incorporating new feedback and moving towards um, new versions as we go along. Um, we, have, we have put the link in the chat so everybody can, can click on it and, and get and contribute to uh, give you comments. Um, <clears throat> where do we stand with the data model? Have there been any specification already in the data model or is that subject to evolution and change? Yeah, so the current data model that's in RC1 that has been vetted quite by quite a bit of experts already. Again, this is building off existing guidance in the home-based records for childhood vaccinations and as well as the International Certificate of Vaccination for Prophylaxis. Um, and so these are quite strong requirements and we're trying to combine the two as well as allowing for it to work in a digital space. So for example, in the International Certificate for Vaccination or Prophylaxis, or I'll just refer to it as the yellow card, which is what it's more commonly known as. It has a requirement for a health worker's signature as well as an administering center's stamp. Um, so when we move to our sigil, we need to figure out what those needs are, but then there are key basic data elements that are required for um, continuity of care, for someone to have an accurate representation of their medical records, for them to be able to talk to their next healthcare provider to know what, boot, what dose to get next, if they need booster doses and things like that. And I think the other thing to note that um, for us, the continuity of care use case is the first and foremost um, primary use case. Um, I know a lot of discussions, especially in the media, even amongst this panel has been the proof of vaccination. So using the certificate for something, but as WHO it's really about the health of an individual that's the primary priority. So an individual needs to have access to their own records to then be able to make appropriate choices like getting additional doses or just, it's a key part of an individual's health record. Um, and so the data model has been built in such a way. Um, for those more technological savvy folks in the call, we are leveraging the FHIR standard, F-H-I-R, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources Standard as the data structure. Um, for semantic standards, we are um, encouraging countries to use ICD-11 as that will become a mandate in 2022. Um, but we do provide mapping guidance to other semantic terminologies as well. Um, okay. I think the last thing to note is, again, this is always constantly evolving, but yeah. I think for us, it's most important to note that that continuity of care use case is the primary and whether or not a subset of that data element, which I think is still up for discussion of what would actually be required to prove so someone that you have a vaccine and what level of uses there, mm. that's definitely still up for discussion. Um, so we would appreciate this community's feedback there as well. And just one last thing, Ned. Um, mm -hmm. Could you point out in the data structures, 
whether there is an identifier um, that's built in and what kind of identifier um, is that? Sure, so we did include a field for unique identifier as optional. Um, I think the reason for this is because first and foremost, we definitely do not think people need to have an identification document to receive a vaccine. From a public health perspective, it's really everyone should get the vaccine and they should have access to their own health records as this is a certificate that someone would be holding on to. Um, it's not as critical to have their own ID linked to that. However, there are um, electronic medical record systems, for example, that might have a unique identifier, not a formal like national ID or anything like that, that links that individual to the rest of their health records. So not just vaccination records. Um, so we leave that up to the member state to determine how they want to manage that. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and you, you, one thing you, you did not mention, but I know you've been thinking about is this twin form factor. Could you just briefly touch on that? Sure. So the other thing that um, is really important to us is the equity aspect of things. I think mm -hmm. what you see dominated in the media is all of these vaccination apps. Um, the reality is that most people do not have access to smartphones. So it's really more about an individual having access to their medical record and having a digital, what we're referring to as a digital twin. So what practically means is that if someone loses their vaccine certificate, they should be able to go to their healthcare provider and get the record kind of printed out again, so to speak. And so it's safe in a digital format. For example, for my yellow card, if I lose it, I would have to get another yellow fever vaccine. I can't just go to my previous healthcare provider to get a new card. Um, and so for us, that's really that digital twin. And we've designed the specs specifications for the smart vaccination certificate with paper first in mind. So that at the bare minimum, someone should have a paper certificate with a QR code on it, essentially that links it to some sort of digital record of their vaccine record. Um, whether or not countries and member states and other um, use cases want to develop a smartphone app, that's, that's great, by all means do that. But for us, it's the first and foremost thing is ensuring that people have access to the medical records and being able to get a backup of that. So um, Excellent. that's the Excellent. twin concept, yeah. And this is an excellent overview of your initiative on smart vaccination, which is essentially the evolution of the yellow uh, book or yellow card mm -hmm. into the digital world with the twin being the strategy. Um, uh, wonderful. We'll come back. I'd like to move on. And in this way, I think I'm going to ask a tandem tag team between Dr. Karen um, and Raj uh, from IKO and ISO, because I know you, you are, the two of you are working together on the IKO initiative and the specifications. So what are you specifying and how does it relate to what the WHO is specifying? Should I jump in, uh, yes, Rajesh, sure. and maybe just yeah. give a little bit of background and then you can yeah. maybe go into the specifications? Yeah. So I would like to just, just before going into exactly what we're specifying, just give a, give a background of how we've worked and uh, how we've come to the exact specifications, which uh, Rajesh will describe. So basically, we're working on this uh, due to the demand of the member states. Uh, our IKO Council of Member States uh, came to IKO and said, we, we need something in this space to deal with health certificates. The council back in April of last year set up a Council Aviation Recovery Task Force, CART, we'll call it, that worked, uh, has been working actually since then over a couple of phases to... Uh, to provide some solutions to stimulate recovery in aviation. And of course, they started with more uh, basic questions, trying to, to provide immediate solutions to the challenges that presented back in April and May and through summer of last year. But over time, knowledge has developed, uh, experience has developed, and challenges have developed, and opportunities have developed. And one of those potential opportunities, of course, was uh, health proofs, initially testing and uh, increasingly the case of vaccination as a possible stimulant of recovery. So in January of this year, uh, phase three of CARP began, and I would say one of, if not the primary uh, things that the CARP wanted to look at was health certificates, test certificates as a primary case, and to a certain extent, vaccination certificates, test certificates, initially because testing was already out there and in use, and but also uh, acknowledging and respecting what I want to reiterate from the beginning or state from the beginning that the mandate for vaccination certificates internationally is with WHO, as we've just said. So ICAO is not trying to usurp that role and define something in, it, in itself or by itself. What it's trying to do is 
first of all, make sure that the requirements for a proof of vaccination, particularly in the aviation space, are acknowledged, uh, contributing to the Smart Vaccination Certificate Working Group in that way. Uh, and also making sure that what we mentioned at the outset, the fact that IKEA was already the holder of the most established, I would argue, secure credential out there, the passport, to make sure that experience and knowledge is leveraged. And then in terms of producing something, what we have produced are specifications and a guidelines paper for what we call visible digital seal, which uh, is initially put forward, like I say, for the purposes of testing, uh, for, for a proof of testing in the context of air travel. But when we were developing it for that, and we had a group, what we call a multidisciplinary working group of experts contributing to the development of both the policy guidelines and specifications for this visible digital seal. Also in the back of our mind was the fact that, well, we'll put this forward to the WHO, we'll explain it to them, highlight in the context of the group discussions, the fact that some of these elements could potentially play a role, discuss with the wider community and see whether they could play a role in vaccination. Maybe before handing over to, to Rajesh, I just want to explain and maybe highlight a couple of the real priorities that we see when we're presenting or when we're looking for solutions for vaccination certificates for aviation uh, and when we're developing a visible digital seal, some of the ideas that are in the back of the mind that, that we feel particularly crucial that a solution fulfill. One of those is the fact that what we, what we want to roll out now has to be quick to roll out. And I'm not talking about the timeline that Nat just spoke about, which means that we'll have some specifications maybe by April or May, June but the fact that when the specifications come, the, the solutions can roll out quickly thereafter because the crisis that has afflicted aviation is unprecedented. The corollary effects of that uh, in terms of economic impacts, social impacts, the fragmentation of world communication, point-to-point -point communication, families, friends, businesses, et cetera, is so substantial that we cannot look to the fact that you know, solutions might come two, three years from now when the opportunity is already there. Secondly, I think we need to respect the infrastructure and the capabilities that are already there. Uh, this comes down to manual border controls, automated border controls, something that's common in Africa, the uh, travel authorization systems, that there's a flexibility that whatever we produce can, can reuse those, both for time reasons, like I've explained, but also for reasons of cost. And maybe finally, the fact that it's flexible and it's globally interoperable, that whatever is in, uh, introduced can be used to suit the processes that are in place, all the stakeholders that are active there respects both the paper and the digital processes as Nat explained, uh, and can work in every single country out there, no matter the level of technical and digital development, no matter the processes that they have in place, no matter their uh, reliance on aviation or the fact that aviation is just maybe a small part of their uh, economy, that all of these facts are fulfilled. And these are really the driving factors to how we have developed the guidelines, specifications, and contributed to the WHO working group. Mm. I'll leave it there. Yeah, Raj, Raj where, where do we stand and where do you hope to get? Yeah, okay, so uh, Kiran pretty much gave all the answers I had prepared, but uh, I'll, I'll take up from where he left off. Uh, so we uh, we started, uh, as you said, uh, with and similar to what Nat said, we start off with a paper first approach. So we're not talking about uh, an app. Uh, we're trying to build on what we already have, the EMRTD, the e-passport. As the editor of the PKI standards for e-passports, I'm very comfortable with that. And I know that its usage in the border control arena is already well established in multiple countries. So riding on that same infrastructure would help us. Um, we also talked about uh, having a signed QR code, including a barcode signer within that. And the main, the main intent was it should be offline verifiable using a trust model that exists right now and is deployed. Uh, so we published the first draft of the specifications on the 3rd of March. Uh, we had a common resolution meeting on the 30th of March. And as a result, the next draft will be published tomorrow. And that will be put up to the New Technologies Working Group for approval uh, to become a standard. Um, so, so uh, operator, please put the links um, in, the, in the chat so that people can follow and keep an eye for that. Um, just let me try to be clear. Um, the scope of what WHO is specifying is strictly vaccination status, while the scope of what you are 
specifying, um, explain the scope. Yeah, so fundamentally, we are looking at both proof of testing and proof of vaccination, but for a very specific use case, which is border crossing. Uh, okay. We're not looking at other uh, scenarios. We're not looking at continuity of care. Uh, it's very specific what will work at the border when you're trying to cross the border. And there is a requirement at that border to present a proof of vaccination. And similarly for a proof of testing. So ours is a very narrow scope. Uh, for the data set, we inherit from what WHO has uh, provided in the release candidate one, and we are working with that. We are not reinventing the wheel in that sense. So it's only about a specification that can work at the border. As, as you may have seen, Europe has specified also the need for recovery uh, certificates. Yeah. Is that something that falls under that same specification that you're working on? Yes, the way it has been defined is it can be used for multiple use cases. And it's only the data set that changes. So the structure remains the same, the trust framework remains the same, the process of issuance and verification remains the same. So, uh, which is what we call a VDSNC, uh, Visible Digital Seal for Non-Constrained Environments. And it can be used for proof of testing with that data set, proof of vaccination with that data set. And in the future, if proof of immunity or past infection becomes relevant, we can very easily include that as a use case within that same data set. Okay, before we move on, one last comparison. Um, Nat was very clear in saying that they do not recommend the use of their vaccination um, certificates for uh, any application other than continuity of health. They're not saying you cannot use them. They're saying we're not actually advocating them. Now, what is the official position of IKO and ISO system? Actually, IKO, maybe that's the proper question about the, are you recommending to the member states that they should use um, these types of COVID passports for the international travel? Or are you saying, no, I'll just say, if you want them, here's a specification. I'll jump in on that. So yeah. um, CART has, uh, CART that I explained at the outset has uh, what we call a set of recommendations. There are 20 recommendations. Uh, and one of those recommendations uh, relates to, to use of certificates, both for testing and vaccination. It's recommendation 18, if I'm not mistaken. And it states very, very explicitly, and this fully aligned with what the World Health Organization guidelines are on this. I think it was stated at the outset that we do not recommend in any way that vaccination be a prerequisite for travel. So that's important to state, first of all. So at no point right now, at least, should vaccination be a requirement for travel. But if, if a state wishes to consider vaccination as one of the criteria uh, for, mm -hmm. let's say, accepting people and for entry as part of what we describe as a multi-layer risk mitigation process that will involve hopefully many things beyond uh, vaccination, there might be testing part of it, there will be public health uh, guidelines such as mask wearing, washing of hands, distancing, et cetera, et cetera, will all be part of the picture. But if vaccination is considered as part of that picture, then the certificates that we're speaking about can be part of the picture, uh, can, can be used, and in fact, should be used. We should make sure that certificates, if they are presented, are secure, are globally interoperable, uh, do a test uh, securely and verifiably to a proper vaccination of a person. And okay. it's very, very similar for testing. Testing is not required, but it can be part of the picture. But if you're asking for testing, make sure that the certificates you're asking for are properly configured, are secure, are efficient to use, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so so, so far we've heard about two in, uh, official international uh, initiatives, WHO and IKO. They have definitely, they're, they're independent, separate, but they're highly coordinated. Um, I wanna, sort of pause on this and move to IATA and look at, IATA has a very different uh, constraint. They've got uh, members that are severely impacted. Uh, they have a shoulder, they have shouldered a major, major economic uh, uh, impact from the stop of their aviation activities. And so the question is, what is IATA doing and how do you relate to these initiatives we just heard about and whether you think you're going to be ultimately um, um, merging with them or continuing to run your own initiative, being um, informed by what they're doing. So, um, so Luis, give us a perspective of what's happening at IATA. 
Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a very relevant point, and I just want to emphasise what, uh, what we've heard both from uh, Nat and Karen around the, um, we, we strongly support that uh, member states don't uh, have vaccination as a requirement uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, however, we know that uh, we've seen testing, COVID-19 testing requirements uh, creating considerable confusion across the global travel ecosystem. And as more and more and more member states impose COVID-19 testing requirements, many of which are, are, are very, very different from state to state, uh, and also look to reducing quarantine or, or, or managed isolation, et cetera, for those who have been vaccinated. And I think currently we're sitting at about 14 countries that have vaccination as an entry requirement. Of those uh, 14, I think only two are the same requirement. And what this does, does in, the, in the ecosystem is it creates uh, a very confusing and challenging situation for airlines and for air travellers. We know that the travellers, they need accurate information on any COVID-19 related testing or vaccine requirements for the destination, for, the, for their journey as well as authorised test and vaccination centres. Uh, individuals don't necessarily know where to find it and when the information is presented, it can be confusing or in a hard to understand manner. The airlines are often responsible for ensuring that passengers comply with entry requirements, uh, traditionally documents, passports and visas. Um, and, and in the last year, uh, uh, COVID-19 requirements, but they have no way of verifying the authenticity of the documents. There is no uh, easy way to verify the authenticity of, of um, identity uh, test and, and vaccin vaccination information that's presented by travellers. What we know uh, is that the paper-based processes that are being used to manage the uh, health requirements, existing health requirements, such as the yellow fever card, are not secure are subject to fraud, are slow and cumbersome, and are not scalable. We expect that's a problem that's going to exacerbate if we see uh, vaccination continuing to be uh, an entry requirement, particularly when there's issues of equity around vaccination. Uh, people want access, and, and being denied access uh, to freedom of movement uh, will, drive, um, uh, will drive fraud. Uh, and, and paper-based processes. Um, so we, we support the, uh, the work of both the WHO and the ICAO in looking to quickly move to provide solutions that can be paper-based but are still smart, that still have the ability to um, be authenticated. We know that uh, currently airports and airlines are carrying just under 10% of normal passenger volumes, but many have to have the same number of, of agents at the check-in at, at the airport to physically uh, check uh, test and, and vaccination documentation. We know that this then adds an additional um, risk factor with congregations, queues, long wait times, impacts on social distancing, a lot of handing over of paper documents, uh, which isn't exactly what you want in the middle of a pandemic. So we want to see processes pushed off airport uh, and to ensure that airports and airlines have the su sufficient capacity to uh, enable safe processing and safe movement of people in the airport uh, environment. So against uh, all of this context, we know there's a clear need for, for governments and travellers and industry stakeholders uh, to have some digital solutions to be able to address these challenges if we're going to contribute to a safe and efficient reopening of borders which is where the IATA Travel Pass comes in. And most people, and, and there's been a lot of interest in IATA Travel Pass, it's been a very, very busy time, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and a lot of people think it's primarily uh, an app. Um, but, but IATA Travel Pass refers to an ecosystem uh, provided for all of the stakeholders in that aviation, um, in that aviation sector. Uh, certainly, um, uh, there, there is an app in there that can help the, the travellers store and manage their uh, um, verified certifications for either their COVID tests or their vaccinations. Uh, it's secure and efficient, more secure and efficient than the paper processes, and can be used to manage those health requirements. 
Um, given the potentially enormous scale of testing or vaccination verifications that we've uh, got to, to securely manage in this uh, massive travel ecosystem, we know that there's, there's well, there's four, uh, four key modules in the IATA Travel Pass uh, ecosystem beyond, beyond thinking of the app. Mm. And the, um, the brains behind it is a global registry of health requirements. And this enables the passengers to be able to be presented with accurate information on the travel, health and testing requirements for their journey. This, this is a tool called Tomatic. It's actually been in place for 60-something 60, uh, 60 years. Every single country in the world gives Tomatic, uh, IATA Tomatic, their entry uh, and any exit requirements that they have. Historically, it's been uh, almost um, exclusively around passport and visa and, and ESTA requirements uh, and, and some health requirements for some destinations. And, and it's used um, by, by airlines historically to check that the passenger meets the requirements to check in for their flight to be boarded on that plane because they have the right documentation. Over the last year, that uh, Tomatic has uh, expanded considerably and we've seen the need to build a COVID-19 specific rules engine to be able to provide that information. Alongside that, we have uh, developed a, uh, a built-in uh, registry of COVID-19 testing um, or vaccination uh, centres at the passenger's point of departure or home country in the, um, in, the insta in the instance of vaccination. This is an open source registry, it's global, and it includes the lab information, so contact details, website, uh, from within the app you can click to, to book for your test, etc., um, and geolocation, uh, all that uh, fancy stuff. It provides the passengers with the information on the type of test they need or the type of uh, vaccination certificate that's required and then verifies that what that passenger has uh, will be accepted at the country of arrival. Yeah. Louise, one second. Yeah, what you're saying is really, really interesting. Are you saying that IATA has a list of, of vetted laboratories that are um, qualified to give me a test that you will accept as an airline? Is that we're <laughs> we're building it. We're certainly we're, we're certainly building it. Um, I, the the numbers increase every single day. Uh, we're working with authorities. Um, we're working with airlines and with authorities on the uh, those airlines that are, are um, signed up to uh, to trial uh, IATA Travel Pass. Um, and, and looking at their, their points of origin or their, their points across their journey that they're trialling to ensure that our first priority is onboarding the labs to support the trials that we're implementing. It's an enormous ecosystem. We want to make sure that the laboratories that we're onboarding into the lab register are approved or authorised in some way. We know that there have been not all instances of fraud that have been seen in the aviation ecosystem in the past um, seven or eight months that testing's become more and more prevalent as a requirement for travel. We've seen, you know, there's been some situations where the laboratory itself is the, uh, just uh, making some quick money uh, from this. So we're working to ensure that the laboratories that we put into that registry are, um, are able to be trusted because we know that that's, that's, that's a um, important factor. That's a sort Pause on one second, Nat. Does who have any standards or working on standards to sort of uh, certify laboratories? What do national countries have to look for to make sure that the laboratories that are um, testing are actually conforming to some international standard of reliability? Because they could be, you know, sort of a pop-up laboratory that just makes money. And, and then how do I trust? Is there some trust framework for the laboratory itself, not for the credential net that the World Health Organization is working on? So currently we don't have guidance on that specifically. Like we don't have a list of labs that provide COVID tests um, globally. I think the one thing to note though, that if WHO were to do that, it would have to work directly with the ministries of health and respective member states. And those mm -hmm. ministries of health would be the ones accountable for determining that list. Um, right. Except the standard, they may need an international standard because what's acceptable in yeah. one country 
may not be acceptable or another. I, I refer to the 94303 standard of IQO on breeder, breeder documents, for example. Uh, the same issue, uh, health uh, civil registration system in one country cannot be compared to another country. So we need a standard that says, you gotta have to have these things before you, you as a Ministry of Health can certify that this laboratory is okay. I mean, Ayata, you seem to have done something in that regard, but it's on your own initiative. Is there a room for the international community to work together to establish standards? Obviously, the sovereign nations and ministers of health will be the ones to certify. But if a lack of standards makes comparison between countries difficult. There is, I mean, there is certainly some countries that do operate on a, a national a national register for laboratories, and it's much easier um, on our end when that's the case. Um, there are a, a few countries that we are in the process of direct integration with uh, in terms of their uh, health authorities. So this is where we know that in most or many states, when the, uh, the COVID test is taken, the test centre might present the negative uh, test result to the um, I was about to say passenger citizen, uh, but the, the positive test result, the, the health ministry wishes to handle the communications for, for obvious reasons themselves. So there are already established systems in some, uh, some countries to ensure that, the, the, that that's managed from the centre, from the Ministry of Health. Where, uh, where that exists, it does mean that um, our integration with that Ministry of Health uh, means that the Ministry of Health itself can be the issuer of the test certificate directly to the IATA travel pass, which brings into then the next, the next, the third component, which is the, the, the issuance app of the of the verification of the um, verifiable credential of a test result. Uh, and this is the direct communication between the, the tool that the lab uses or the health authority uses uh, that can issue directly to the digital wallet in the passenger's phone within the app. So the, the IATA Travel Pass app, the heart, the heart of our, of our solution, the heart of the ecosystem. It's mm -hmm. where the passenger creates that digital identity uh, in an authenticated and trusted way, and then is able to um, either have their test results or vaccination results issued directly into the digital wallet in the device, or is yeah. able to consume them by taking, let's say, the, a paper solution such as we've heard about from, from the WHO and from ICAO and ISO to be able to consume that data, verify that data, and create a verifiable credential, which will enable, it will enable um, not only to have the full disclosure for borders where all of the information can be sent from the IATA travel pass, directly to the border authority, showing that it meets the requirements and showing that it's been verified, but it'll also enable a selective disclosure. It will enable some privacy enabled technology where airlines or airports or other people in the ecosystem, hotels, rental car companies, don't necessarily need to know whether or not you're a person who's been vaccinated or whether you, you know, just had a test. It comes back to that equity point as well as privacy preserving, that all you can give in that situation is a green tick to say, I meet the requirements. Right, okay, just just quickly for the for the full panel, I, I'm, we, we wanna keep going. We'll come back to some of the issues in terms of trust, in terms of whatever, but there is a question that seems to be recurring in the World Bank, Jonathan Marskill, has, has basically pointed out. He's saying, we're supporting many countries to develop various delivery systems for their vaccine programs. Many of them are lacking reliable immunization registries um, to store the records to underpin digital vaccine certificates or maybe test uh, records. Uh, are such immunization registries or registries in general prerequisite for the issuance of digital vaccine certificates? Um, maybe I'll, I'll have um, Ayata and Hu, Raj, if you have any, any uh, perspective on that issue. Can we do this without building um, test registries or immunization registries, or those are inevitable. I can tell you one thing, I was shocked to see that New York has kept registries of everybody who has been, who's been uh, uh, vaccinated. I thought this was not the case. I thought they were gonna give me a CDC card and that was it. Then I discovered that I actually know my name, my date of birth, et cetera. And then 14 days later, I'm eligible to get an Excelsior pass. So of course, from my perspective, I'm happy with that because it simplifies my life. But on the other hand, it, it, it begs the question. There is a registry, nobody told me about it. 
I would, if I may. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, where uh, there is absolutely no centralised system within the IATA travel pass. IATA doesn't see any personal information uh, in the IATA travel pass. It's, it's purely held in the passenger's device and communicated directly to the verifier. Um, we know that health authorities may choose, um, just like border authorities, to have their centralised systems, and we understand that. But we know that our members at airlines do not want to be responsible for massive amounts of personal information and want to have solutions that enable that to go. What should be kept, where there should be a registry, is the verifiable data registry. And you have the ICAO uh, PKD as an example, the WHO's looking at a similar solution in that regard with the release one of the, of the smart vaccination uh, certificate. And for, um, for, the, uh, for the industry perspective, what we would like is to know that there was open access to the verifiable, the, the public verifiable data for that the, the uh, and the PKI, the centralised PKI solutions that we have access to the public certificates to enable the verification to say, this is genuine, this is genuine. So we can com communicate that with confidence uh, to travellers and to governments in that ecosystem. Thanks, Louise. Uh, Nat, is there any registry required uh, by the WHO scheme? Sure, I think um, that's a very good question. And I think it's actually a lot more complex than people think. So electronic immunization registries traditionally used for childhood immunizations is quite common in a lot of countries and a lot of member states that are on the way towards digitalizing their health system is going down that path. Um, whether or not that's required to issue a vaccine certificate, though, is a bit of a complex question because it, there's a specific definition for electronic immunization registries. And by that definition, that is not a prerequisite for issuing a vaccine certificate. However, there has to be a way within the member state to be able to verify that they have issued that certificate, whether or not it's a list of public keys that are linked to it, or whether or not it's a list of um, like certificate identifiers that has information about individuals or not. Um, that's up to the member state to decide. And so there's different registries that can be implemented, but whether or not a specific electronic immunization registry that is traditionally known in the immunization space is needed, that is not needed. Of course, that'll obviously make things a lot simpler for member states to implement, but it's definitely not a prerequisite. It's not a requirement. Okay, yeah. Raj, do you have anything else to, to close this scene? Yeah, I just wanted to add one bit here. Uh, Immunization registries are a record for the government to figure out that you were immunized or you need a second vaccine dose and when. The, the format of that and how that is done has got no relation to the issuance of a credential that you need to prove that your government authorizes and says that you have had a vaccine, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the key. Uh, the way that we are defining the, the, the VDSNC in uh, ISO is that it's an offline verifiable piece of information that you carry on a piece of paper, right? Anybody can verify it. So the creation of that is up to the sovereign state. How they maintain that registry of information about who has been immunized is entirely up to them. I don't think mm -hmm. uh, we get involved in that process. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question from media, from Thomson Reuters. Um, and they're asking, what do the panelists think of the African Union's trusted traveler program, which is for COVID tests? Has this been effective since its launch and could this be expanded, developed to be used outside the continent and include vaccine certificates? Is, is anybody aware of this or, or do we need um, Derek? Actually, Louise, you're, you're, you're uh, shaking your head. You, you're aware of that. Can you address it? Uh, yes, um, we've certainly had conversations with the African Union CDC. I think the initiative uh, was it was so quick and uh, and and impressive to to move at the scale that they moved. We're definitely exploring what the opportunities would be to enable uh, an integration into uh, IATA Travel Pass to be able to have that verifiable source uh, direct from the AU. It becomes uh, all of the states that, um, on the continent that are. Uh, our members within the uh, AU CDC's uh, platform uh, and, and that um, creates uh, an instant way of being able to 
uh, verify that the traveller coming from one of the uh, AU states that, that supports the Trusted Traveller platform uh, has, has, a, has a trusted uh, test result and in the future vaccination certificate. So I, I can't comment on the use of that within the industry uh, currently, but um, I, I will say I thought it was, uh, it was so quick to move and I can see uh, potential for it to, 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 to provide a level of trust outside the continent for people on the continent who want to who, uh, resume travel, resume business, see loved ones uh, outside of the continent. So this is a trusted source. Excellent. So we've got a lot of questions in, in, in this related topic, but we need to move on. We need to move on to the next scene. And for that, we are going to look at something that uh, Louise and Kiran have said, which is the ecosystem. This is not a point solution. This is not uh, just simply um, a, a digital um, seal, but in fact, it fits as part of a bigger picture. So we would like to look at the enabling and the complementary environment. And for that, I'd like to also bring in some field realism. Maybe we'll get some African reality here. Um, so we'll ask our, our current panelists to take a pause and we'll switch them with CETA, IOM, and WHO uh, with uh, Derek, uh, if they're ready. Thank you. We'll come back to, to you again for another segment. Okay, so uh, I have with me Jeremy, I have with me Derek, and I have with me Florian. Thank you, thank you so much. I will start um, with CETA. Uh, you've, he you've heard, Jeremy, you've heard about the, the, the various initiatives and clearly um, you are not an organization that specifies um, or, or, or imposes certain standards. You're an organization that enables, that implements, that ha helps countries um, integrate information into the risk management and scale the travel process. So walk us through the enabling environment and the ecosystem that we're going to need to have in place uh, within the context of aviation, clearly, uh, for, for these schemes of COVID passports, whether for testing, whether for vaccination, can become operationalized. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Doc, Doc Attic. And uh, probably worth saying CETA does also work in um, land and sea borders as well as aviation, although clearly we're owned by the aviation industry and therefore you know, that's a, a core part of our focus and, and largely where I was going to going to focus on today. Um, and as both Kieran and Louise said, um, clearly that the overall travel industry has been massively impacted by the pandemic. And, uh, um, and therefore, in order to try and recover the industry as quickly as possible, we've recently launched our Health Protect solution, which um, aims to um, uh, very quickly move to um, an industry-wide solution to uh, address this issue by reusing existing aviation uh, passenger and border processes and integrating them with certificates and health pass schemes, such as, I guess, the IR to travel pass that uh, Louise uh, explained as, we, uh, as we've just heard. Um, so we've been working, um, looking at how we can adapt those existing systems that are in place today in order to meet the, I guess, the health screening requirements and that verification requirements that Louise was talking about as the traveller makes their journey. Um, and a lot of my focus is on the border um, and cross-border travel. And most governments take a, a layered approach to border management and to managing their borders. And that starts well before you travel at all. Um, before the pandemic, um, typically the traveller would be required to apply for entry into a country by um, applying for a visa or an electronic travel authority, an ETA. Um, and now what we're now seeing is that additionally, governments are requesting travellers to complete a, a COVID test, um, you know, is what we're seeing now, and we'll, we'll I guess we're yet to see exactly who, which countries are really going to also ask for a vaccination, but certainly to travel, most countries are requesting a COVID test to be completed. And also for that passenger to complete a, um, a health ETA, um, sometimes known as a travel declaration, or also known as a passenger locator form. So some form of ability to enable the government to know that you're planning to travel 
um, and to try and undertake some initial risk assessment at that early stage in the process to confirm that you're okay to travel. And um, we've been implementing and working with governments around the world to look at these solutions. A good example is the uh, Australia Travel Direct Declaration System that uh, we launched with Australia back in November, really focused on how um, people can uh, enter that country um, using um, uh, due, due to COVID. Um, and ideally, what we want to do is link that declaration to the trusted certificate. Um, and either that is a, uh, um, uh, a, a trusted test certificate or linking them to a health pass um, type scheme. And um, um, uh, typically what we're seeing, therefore, is that that test for the passenger will need to be completed um, 72 hours um, before travel. But that also obviously varies by, um, by country. And by doing that, um, we're giving confidence to both the traveller that they've got the authority to travel because they'll get a response back from the government to confirm that uh, they've received the, uh, the authority to travel, their declaration. So they've got some confidence they're going to be allowed across their border. And the government obviously understands who is travelling and can understand the risk profile of that passenger. Um, they, you know, typically the declaration would include questions around where they might have recently visited, um, the reason for their travel, and the type of certificate they've got. And that all obviously um, can vary the, the risk profile of the individual and give the government confidence to allow entry into that country. So that's very much the first step. Um, critically, the next step is at check-in. And um, most governments don't want um, passengers to fly, you know, several hours or a long distance, arrive at their border and find that there is an issue. Um, governments would prefer to ensure that passengers that aren't going to be allowed across their border to not be a, approved to travel in the first place. And so therefore, critically, if a government has a, an advanced passenger processing system or an interactive API system, um, what we want to do is enable the passenger to check in for their flight in exactly the same way they always did pre-COVID, um, using ideally online or self-service technology. And that way, the passenger wouldn't need to show their test certificate or their vaccination certificate um, at check-in, as the health check can be done by the system and that health verification can be done by the system in the background in the same way, for example, a visa check is, is undertaken today uh, using those systems. So the, largely the way it works is that at the point of check-in, um, the airline will send a standard advanced passenger information message to the government. Um, uh, the government system will undertake a real-time verification and health status check. Ideally, also clearly checking against the health declaration the passenger has already made and they'll respond back to the airline within a matter of seconds that that passenger is okay to travel and uh, can check in for their flight and board their, uh, board their flight. And I think really importantly for the industry is that this avoids the big challenge that airlines have got today of having to manually check in every passenger because they're required to check the test certificate of the, uh, of the passenger that's traveling and, um, and, and confirm that they can, they can travel. So we can hopefully return to as much as normal as possible as an industry by enabling online and use of self-service technology at the airport uh, for check-in. Um, so that's, that's really critical. Jeremy, does that require a different platform than the IATA Travel Pass or IATA Travel Pass is part of what you would be integrating? Exactly. What, what this solution does is enable those, those past schemes to work within the existing aviation industry processes that are already there today. Um, so um, what we'll do is the passenger can use um, their, their, their travel pass. Um, uh, they can declare that as part of their, um, their, their health declaration before travel. Um, and then um, that information can be verified by the, the government and then they can then use their, their normal check-in process um, to confirm in real time back to the government that that, that passenger can, can travel using that travel pass. 
So it's all done in the background and enables these pass schemes to work. And, and you, you basically the interoperability will happen from the fact that you may be able to accept multiple different schemes and governments might be able to accept multiple different schemes, but the authorization is unique in the sense that we're telling you now, no matter what scheme you were participating with, now you've got an authorization to enter the country before you even board the plane. Correct, correct. In, a, in effect, it acts as a gateway between gateway. all of the, the health pass schemes and the certificate providers, because right. you know they, it, it might be that somebody has is not using a pass scheme, they're, they're, they're just sending a, uh, a certificate as part of that declaration. Okay. Um, and it, it sort of acts as that gateway between those providers and the aviation industry and the government. Right. And Jeremy, I'm going to bring you brings the government into that equation. Sorry, Jeremy, I'm going to bring you back um, in, in, a, in, a, in a subsequent scene. So pause on here, hold on to this. Let me move on to um, Florian and try to understand IOM. IOM has um, a significant um, interest in borders. Um, you don't specify, just like CETA, you don't specify um, standards, but you do help countries implement. Um, and operationalize the, the border. You also um, have another mission which you, you really uh, focus on, which involves the refugees, internal displaced people, etc. So for this part, uh, focus on, on the, the big picture, the realism. We've got these passes, we've got these schemes. Uh, now we go to the border, the border doesn't look like this. The, the lines are not managed this way. Um, when we look at especially Africa and other places, how do we bridge the gap between what looks good on paper and the reality on the ground? Um, and what is IOM doing? I know you published something very interesting today, so maybe you can tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Attic. And um, so IOM is the UN um, migration agency so we work mainly with migrants. So for refugees, we have another UN organization, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, with whom we collaborate very closely. Um, but actually, migrants, including refugees and then labor migrants, uh, uh, are very much affected by the current crisis, very much affected by the mobility restrictions, and uh, this on a global level. And I, I went today, actually, has published a report. I, I will send it in the chat the link to you uh, together with the Migration Policy Institute in Washington. Uh, we have a presentation uh, later this afternoon in uh, uh, Europe time, so later this morning in Washington time. Um, IOM's role is, uh, as I've said before, is not, we, we don't develop standards, but we are very much involved in the development. So we participate actively in the WHO working group and the ICAO working groups. Uh, and uh, bring in our expertise and our know-how from especially how the situation is on the ground. I have some 20,000 collaborators around the world, most of them not based in Geneva, but mo mostly all of them based in countries in the field. And what we do specifically in the immigration and border management field where I'm presenting is that we work together with immigration and border management authorities around the globe to build capacity, to further enhance capacity, provide technical support, also provide certain services. So I think, you know, the reality that we see on the, on the, on the ground in, in many parts of the world, but maybe not also specifically uh, on the African continent, as we have uh, long borders, very porous borders, we have a lot of informal cross-border uh, movements between border communities, you know, which might belong to the same ethnicity, but living on the two sides of the borders, people who make a living by daily trading across the border. Uh, so, you know, any kind of solution that will have to come out also has to look at these aspects, uh, as, at these interests. You know, people who, uh, uh, who do not normally go through a visa process, but who go over the border, uh, trade, and then come back. And that is actually quite essential economy for many uh, border communities around the world. Uh, so, you know, also the trade aspect there is very important, the human aspect. Uh, um, we um, look at uh, here in a situation where especially labor migrants are very much affected uh, by the current restrictions on the one hand side because certain industries such as tourism where we have a lot of labor migration have been very badly affected by the crisis and by the mobility restrictions uh, or uh, as I said you know, people involved in 
more informal cross-border trade, which nevertheless in terms of numbers is very essential. So, you know, what we try to do as IOM is on the one hand side in these fora we have discussed before, you know, this high level uh, technical expert groups that work on global solutions is to bring in also this uh, know-how and this, ex, um, this situation from on the ground. And then once the solution is worked out, you know, to try to help countries to, uh, to, uh, to roll it out and to implement it. Because the one thing is that you have standards in place. The other thing is that especially developing countries, transition countries with not such strong technical structures already in place or legislative structures in place, they need support to actually then also include them. And uh, the overall concern there is that we have to make sure that uh, we don't have large groups of human mankind excluded from human mobility. Human mobility is a development driver, is a very positive driver for development. And also migration, safe, orderly, and regular migration, a very positive driver. And we have to make sure that not large parts of human, of, of human mankind are excluded. This is, I think, our major concern and our major work in this time. And then I can go to further technologies, but I will not do that here now. Just keep it with that. I will share with you the report. Uh, yes, just put it down in the big, chat. In the chat. Yeah. Yeah, which, which has just been published today, which is called COVID-19, the state of global mobility in 2020. And you know what we have to now look at uh, in right. 2021 to find solutions. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to bring you back into some ethical discussion later, but I want to um, bring some realism by talking to Derek a little bit. Derek, Africa has gone through pandemics before. We've gone through the Ebola. If any continent knows about pandemics, it's Africa. Um, what do you see um, Africa needs to do to mobilize its response? Um, I'm not talking about the response to COVID in general, but the response to be able to be ready to participate and remain connected to the global community. Uh, and then what, what lessons have we learned from previous pandemics like Ebola? Thanks, Dr. Atik. And uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy and Floriana, for those wonderful interventions. Uh, this is an extremely important topic. And so your remarks actually are quite on target. In fact, uh, what uh, Jeremy was speaking to is exactly what the Africa CDC and the African Union is actually trying to do. So there's some alignment there. So mm -hmm. I would like to uh, really um, you know, touch upon the points that uh, Atik that you've raised in terms of uh, African member states and the lessons learned, and indeed what uh, should be fast tracked at this point. There are some significant lessons that we are harvesting from the Ebola situation. Uh, it was an emergency. We saw a lot of digitization taking place. We saw a lot of uh, solutions coming into those countries that were affected. And at the same time, this was a rapid response. Some solutions were being prepared on the fly. Some solutions were being customized. We are rapidly also observing the fact that there were some key systematic, systemic issues, such as the readiness of the health workforce to use the digital solutions. And also the burden of data collection. Some forms were designed as though they were a research form. And some forms were deployed in settings where a physician, a healthcare care provider would rather choose the patient than write on the paper record. So that emergency indeed taught us a lot. And, and one of the key learnings from there is that uh, the issue around coordination from the government perspective and using the government perspective as an entry point is quite critical. And as an organization at WHO, we've been supporting the member states in Africa to really look at the entry point, which is national strategies that respond to you know, epidemics. We are pleased that a number of member states on the African continent have been able to develop these instruments of response. Uh, you know, uh, about 68% of member states on the African continent at least have an e-health or digital strategy. And so what we like to really ensure that we don't repeat is the vertical approach that we saw during the COVID, uh, during the Ebola situation, but really building upon the existing ecosystem that's where national strategies sit. And I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, the, the, what I mean by the ecosystem. So Dr. Aitik, what we've actually been supporting member states to do is really to build uh, these foundational uh, governance structures that create an enabling environment for digital interventions. Really thinking around the leadership and governance, what structures exist both within the health sector and beyond. Really thinking around the whole of government, whole of society approach. And what kind of services and applications are fit for purpose that have been tried, tested, that can be scaled. 
and what standards indeed need to be adopted to ensure that these solutions are, are interoperable and to make sure that we've achieved both semantic interoperability and also technical interoperability. Issues around infrastructure and what we saw in the Obola days was that some of the digital solutions uh, came, as, you know, were deployed assuming of the connectivity. And so some of the barriers we saw there was a lack of con connectivity that, lind that hindered data collection. And so within the sphere of the building blocks of the national strategies, the question around infrastructure is one question that member states are factoring in before determining the deployment of a digital solution. Issues around legislation, police and compliance, making sure that you have sufficient regulations that govern the protection of the data that is being collected. And more importantly, the seventh pillar, which is around those workforce. As I mentioned, during the Ebola days, we, there was a big assumption that the health workforce was capable of using the solutions that were being deployed. And so within the space of national strategies, it's extremely critical that we're also looking at the human side of things in terms of making sure that the health workforce is able to actually utilize the digital solutions across the sectors. And once again, we have just published, uh, you know, last year at, at, at the World Health, as, as, as Health Assembly, a global strategy on digitalization with four pillars, partnerships, uh, focus on global uh, national strategies, and also the fo focus on governance uh, at national level and making sure that we're putting people first. Really making sure that uh, all these interventions we're dealing with are sitting within the national um, you know, uh, strategy on digitalization is quite critical. So that we avoid what we've seen in countries um, that, that have been you know, uh, faced with so many applications that are not managed by the government. I think Uganda is uh, well known for pilotitis because they had issued a moratorium there because of so many vertical applications. It's extremely critical not to repeat uh, this pilotitis or as others speak about it, appetitis, you know, different apps that do things, but really making sure that these are sitting within um, a, a, a government-led national strategy on digitalization. I think, uh, Atif, these are my interventions on that question. So it's basically what you're saying is that who is taking a methodological approach, not a knee-jerk reaction. You, you believe we have to prepare ourselves to not just managing this pandemic, but and as it becomes endemic and other pandemics coming along the way, this is the opportunity to really have interoperable standards and exchange of knowledge across countries to prepare everyone to make sure that we're using the adopt, adopting the best practices to deal with this. Knee-jerk reactions with just uh, an app, one app here and one app there is not gonna solve this problem. And who's taking a systematic approach? Is that fair to say? Yeah, to say what's it to that Okay, perfect, excellent. Um, I'm gonna come back to 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 you. I'm gonna change scenes. Just let's let's take another perspective. Let's bring in the Center for Global Development, Alan and Edgar from the uh, London School of Economics. We'll bring in some of the other panelists as we go. This is scene four. Um, Alan and Edgar. Edgar. Good to see you. Um, you've heard from the organizations that are specifying what, where they think we're gonna be going. But I wanna start with you. Um, you have been plugged into the media, you've been contributing to it. Um, where do you think the world is heading? I mean, are we at the cusp of some mania that's gonna be out there with everybody wanting to do uh, COVID passports for every aspect of life? Or do you think there's gonna be some reasonable guidance and, and restraint that's going to emerge. Thanks. That's a really interesting way of, of, of phrasing the question because what we've already heard is how easy it is to, to, to move from one notion of passport uh, to another. So we heard the World Health Organization saying this is primarily about uh, continuity of care, making sure that everyone's been vaccinated, they get their two doses, uh, etc. Then we very quickly moved into proof of vaccination to allow for travel. But of course, nobody recognizes, nobody wants proof of vaccination to be the requirement uh, for travel. So that ultimately pushes the question back to the, uh, the, the, the risk to others that having COVID uh, presents and the potential uh, responses uh, to that. So that's why, uh, and, and certainly in the work that we did for the Ada Lovelace Institute, our, our sense was that at this point in time, we do not yet know enough about whether or not a being vaccinated 
has a benefit uh, in terms of safety to others, reducing the risk to others. Absolutely, being vaccinated reduces your own risk of hospitalization, serious illness, uh, and possibly death. The risk to others, the risk of transmission is a lot less clear. We are hoping that the, the vaccine will follow the similar path to all of the other vaccines that we have, and that being vaccinated also reduces uh, the risk of transmission. But that uh, risk to others ultimately becomes the, the, the decision criteria that you should be using whether you are allowing people into your country, whether you are allowing people into your um, hospitality environment, whether you're allowing people to mix more freely without uh, the kinds of social distancing uh, that, uh, that we have. And if you start thinking about it in terms of risk to others, then you can immediately see both the potential attractiveness, but also the challenges around, let's move away from, as you said in your opening slides, not just proof that you've been vaccinated for those people lucky enough to have been vaccinated, but let's also consider people who've been recently tested and have tested negative with all the conditions about different tests and the quality of the different tests, uh, et cetera. And then also the possibility of uh, maybe you have some natural immunity, typically because you've had COVID previously and your body still has the antibodies that the vaccine uh, would potentially offer. Right. Hold, hold on, Edgar. Yeah. Pause one second. I want to view both of you now as, as policy advisors. I am a country, you're my policy advisors. I'm going to start with Alan and I'm going to say, please give me a policy recommendation. Should I launch um, a COVID passport scheme, um, if, I, if I should, what should it be for what applications and, and or, or should I take a wait and see attitude? So Alan, please give me a, a clear policy recommendation. And then Edgar, I want you to echo, um, agree or disagree with, with what that policy recommendation would be. Well, thank you, Joseph. Um, I think, Joseph, I would first distinguish between two questions. The first is, what do we do now in terms of the use of system? How would we use them? You know, where are they useful given our state of knowledge? Right. And there I think Edgar has made some very important points, that there are very large knowledge gaps in our yep. system. And so we have a huge amount of uncertainty as to really the, the value and the use of these systems. That is one question. But the other question is the development of the infrastructure the electronic systems, the registration systems that allow us to manage health well. And as a byproduct of that, to do whatever is useful in terms of mitigating risk of infectious diseases. So I think the first advice I would give to a government is to get your data systems in order. Number one, right? Okay. We know, according to my colleagues at the center, that only about 30% of low and medium income country governments have the kind of electronic registers that will allow them to issue this kind of certification in the first place. But by the same token, that means that only 30% 30, 30 of them can track their own vaccinations properly. So I would say start there, start at the point where these systems have to be um, grounded, based, and how people can interact with the systems. So that's where I would give the priority. In terms of the use and the rollout of the system, I think <clears throat> from the international point of uh, view- is what, uh, Mine is a uh, complaint. So just uh, have uh, just uh, you know, sit as long as you talk. Hey, uh, you know, can somebody turn off their, their so I'm, uh, I'm the microphone? Yeah, from the, from the point of use of the system, to some degree, this may be there are pressures going to become pressures on countries for international reasons and factors that are beyond their control, right? But insofar as there are factors within their control, they should be using these systems in a cautious way, in a realistic way. And I think many of the uses of the system that have been, you see in the press, for example, reopening countries in the summer, these systems are not going to be ready anyway by the summer. And the practicalities of using them in the way that people are talking about, I mean, it's really not a proposition. 
So I would say, get the infrastructure in place. This is not going to be the first, the last pandemic. Okay, so are you, are you saying that at this stage in time, do you not see justification for countries to rush and use these schemes for reopening their economy domestically and, and just saying, well, if there is a requirement internationally, then it's out of your control. Your citizens have to comply. So yeah. you have to, do that, that's where yeah. it would be. Okay. I, um, I think broadly, broadly, yes, but I would add that many countries are not in the position to be able to do that. As a you're not able plan. to do that. So you need to prepare yourself uh, yeah. for the eventuality. Edgar, what's your perspective on that? And then I'm gonna bring in another dimension in the discussion. Just, just give me your perspective on that. Yeah. So, so I, I absolutely uh, agree with Alan in terms of get the importance of getting the basics right, getting the vaccines out, uh, potentially rolling out testing if you haven't got access to vaccines. But both of those have clear socioeconomic consequences. If you are a poor economy, you can't afford the vaccines. You have to rely on uh, the, the kind of global donations of vaccines and equally having good testing capabilities is, is there. But you also face, the, the, there's, a, there's a twin pressures on, on national governments. There's the health element, but there's also the economic uh, pressures. And we see, we're seeing that in Europe where countries that have been decimated in terms of tourism are pushing to allow foreign tourists into their economies to come and spend money, etc. But mm. we need to be very clear that that is being driven for economic reasons rather than because we know that the health effects, uh, particularly in terms of transmission, uh, right. are limited. Well, let me actually ask you the question. I've spoken with some countries, that some authorities that are using these schemes and I asked them the question, and they posed me a question that I could not answer as I'm not an immunologist. And their question was, is there any reason to expect that the efficacy of a vaccine um, for COVID is going to behave any differently than any other vaccine we've seen in the past. you got antibodies. Uh, it does not allow uh, you to get infected, but it also does not allow you to transmit the disease. In order to transmit the disease, you have to have a body that's replicating and then able to produce it and send it out. So they're saying, we're taking a bet. And that bet could mean the difference between yeah billions of dollars for the summer and between us waiting and saying, let the scientists get us the data. And they say, there's no harm in us taking the, the, the risk. And some countries are doing so. So Edgar, what, what do you think about, about that thinking? So, so, so obviously the, 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 the risk decision needs to be taken by, by the country. I think the broad direction of travel is, as you suggested, that the vaccines will, over time, we will have evidence, good scientific evidence, peer-reviewed evidence, that it reduces the transmission. The other challenge, of course, we have at the moment is all of the variants. So mm -hmm. the, the Kent variant, the British variant, is currently running rampant across mainland Europe. It also seems to be the dominant one uh, in the United States. Yeah. And if you don't have high, high enough levels of vaccination or natural immunity, then you are still going to be affected by have consequences for your own healthcare system. So it may be that the tourists don't fill up your healthcare system, but it may still be uh, the, local, the local population, particularly if they've not been vaccinated. And that's a really difficult choice decision to actually make. Okay, let us, let us take a quick poll and have both of you comment on what the results, if you see any surprises in them. What we're asking the audience is whether they support uh, the use of vaccine passports for various applications. So let's put, it, put that up. Um, people, uh, attendees, you can just click next and then answer. There are only five categories that you have to, to look at. So please, please vote, um, travel, cultural events, access to restaurants, um, you have also uh, accessing stores, this is for shopping, accessing office buildings. So let's just keep going. Um, please vote and so that we get a perspective of where the community thinks that there are legitimate uses and we should take the risk and, and implement them. Um, clearly, we, um, I don't know if Alan or Edgar, either one of you, would like to comment on other national initiatives or regional initiatives like your EU Green Pass 
and the other national initiatives. Alan, maybe you can comment on what the United States position officially relative to uh, vaccine yeah. passports have been. Okay, so I'm gonna keep the, the, um, the, the poll going for just one more second. Actually, um, operator, you can, you can stop it. That's enough, it gives us a chance to see. Okay, so um, for the benefit of those on YouTube, basically 78% of the people said yes for travel. They think this is legitimate. Uh, for cultural events, we're getting almost split split. 53 saying yes, 47 saying no. Accessing restaurants, basically 63 is saying no. This is not legitimate. Uh, accessing stores, 71% saying no and 29 saying yes. Accessing office buildings, we seem to have a similar split. 56 is no, 44 saying yes. Um, <clears throat> Edgar and Alan, anything in these results are surprising to you? We're gonna put them into the chat. Uh, the audience could also comment on the chat uh, as, as you see fit. But uh, do you see any surprises here? So I, I'm astonished by the, the very different attitudes to risk between uh, international travel and going into a, an, an office building because your risk of transmission uh, is going to be the same whether you're going uh, traveling internationally or, or, or not. So I, I think there's something interesting there around perceptions of uh, the risk. The mm. other challenge, of course, is that uh, in many economies, there were periods of ease restrictions you can so the UK will be reopening or England will be reopening non-essential shops from Monday so mm -hmm. the idea that you would suddenly stop people going into non-essential shops uh, unless they've been vaccinated or tested negative almost seems a negative step uh, for an economy that has previously said we recognize the economic benefits of allowing people to purchase not just food items and not just medicines but mm -hmm. uh, new clothes, etc. So I think there's some very interesting but very confused perceptions going on around uh, the risks. Mm. Alan, do you care uh, to comment? Yeah, actually, that was what I expected, Joseph. I expected that there would be more in favor of the travel and less in favor of the domestic applications. Seems to and be. I think one reason is that people are quite used to the idea of prerequisites for travel. We yeah. already have those. We have passports. We have to get visas. And there's also a process for that. And there are also pre-registration processes for that, the kind of things we've been hearing about before. But when you think of the practical difficulties of requiring a high level of assurance credential to enter a shop, I mean, that yeah. is a very difficult thing as to see how you would do it. And I think people instinctively understand the difficulties of requiring this at a high level of assurance, mind you not necessarily just showing a paper card in order to enter a domestic facility. Okay, before I ask both of you um, uh, to, to co comment on the European initiative and the US status, mm -hmm. um, can I bring in something that seems to have gone to the cemetery and died? It's called track and trace, do you remember that? So do you think vaccine passports could end up having the same fate as track and trace apps, which seem to have, gotten the bad end of the stick and uh, they seem to not be in use anywhere in the world. So anyway, give me, give me your perspective, starting with Edgar. Do you think we're uh, heading so, in the same direction? Yeah, uh, so again, with the English economy reopening uh, on Monday, uh, we're, we will be asked to do track and trace when we go and sit outside in the pubs and in the restaurants. And they've actually tightened up the rules that it has to be each individual, not just one person per party that will have to check in. Uh, the, the, the logic I think is that if there is an outbreak, uh, despite vaccinations, despite negative tests, et cetera, that you still need to close down uh, the, the transmission of the disease. So I suspect track and trace may not, is not quite as dead as you think it is. You, are you saying that in the UK, in order for me to be eating with my friends and being out, out and about, I am obligated to turn on and have the government track where my whereabouts are? Is this, how do they know that I'm, I'm, I'm on or not, or not on? How do I turn location services yeah. on? So, 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 so this kind of comes back to Alan's point about the practicalities of doing it. So uh, the, the 
the England and Wales Track and Trace app, scans a QR code, and it does uh, the Google, uh, Apple kind of on the device rather than sh shared. And the simple, uh, all that happens is if you, if in the restaurant where you were eating with your family, someone then gets a positive uh, test result, then everybody who has checked into that location gets a notification without the government necessarily uh, knowing that. But the intention is- But it's voluntary, that, it's voluntary. I have to turn it on voluntarily, you know? Uh, the, <laughs> That's the, in practice, it will kind of be a de facto requirement that okay. if there is proper uh, venue entry control, that you will at least have to hold your phone up to the QR code and probably make a clicking sound so that it think that, that the person who's okay. maybe on a minimum wage thinks that you have actually registered for that right. process. Interesting. Alan, what, what, what do you think? Track yeah. and trace in the US hasn't gone far. No. Um, Joseph, I, I don't think that the vaccine passport idea is something that has just popped out and is going to die down. I think, uh, you know, uh, it is a long run. It is really a long run issue about the management of information, the management of health information. And I think that some of the more uh, exuberant uh, predictions of how it's going to be used this time around will not happen. And actually, I think that if it was forced to be used in that way, there would probably be a reaction against it in many countries that mm. would be severely negative. Um, mm. But I think that the, uh, the principle and the data systems behind it are going to keep it developing. There's not a flash in the pan. It's, it's, you, you think it has long-term sustainability, at least for some context? I think that the systems that need to underlie it will be developed in the long okay. term. They will continue to develop. And that uh, in uh, 10 or 15 years time, we will have a fairly comprehensive system which enables us to track a variety of, uh, of things on the health side. Okay, so it's going to desensitize the public to this issue and then allow yes. us to, yeah. to accept such notion to, to exist. Right. Okay, I, I asked you about Europe and the US, so, yeah. so I want you to answer that. But in the meantime, I want to bring in um, uh, Derek from WHO and also the IOM, because we want to talk a little bit about the ethical dimension, ethical and legal dimension with you uh, too as well. So, so maybe uh, while we're bringing the, the two other panelists to the panel, uh, Edgar, could you bring us up to speed with where Europe is and the thinking and, and, and how the implementation at the level of the countries would proceed? Uh, okay, so, so the European Union uh, has its own proposals to do something very, very similar to uh, the, the, the various others to have a standard data set uh, linked to identity because they need to uh, address the risks of uh, fraud. And of course, the risks of fraud, the incentives for fraud become much uh, enhanced if you need to demonstrate your COVID health status to be employed, to go into a, a, a busy nightclub, to attend a concert or a sporting uh, event or whatever. So you get some very, very perverse uh, incentives. What's particularly fascinating about the EU documents, but I think it's also there in many of the other proposed standards, and there's almost as many standards as there are uh, international organizations, and you can pick and choose which ones you want to have, is that although they all emphasize this role of being privacy enhancing and only disclosing the data that you must, that you need for that purpose, almost all of them in their first iterations talk about the, the privacy issues being in the next version. And the next brand. Uh -huh. So it's privacy by design, except it's not by design. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Alan, could you talk about what's happening in the US, yeah. US being advanced in its vaccination efforts? Um, yeah. Um, Joseph, we've been trying to follow what's been happening in the US. And actually, that is not too easy because my impression is that it's a very confused situation. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, the US is a highly decentralized country. Uh, civil registration is done by the states. The vaccination process is not uh, at federal level. It is being driven by state and local authorities. Uh, there is no integrated database, and I understand that there is no intention to create one. Uh, only some of the states, I believe somewhere around half right now, have the capability 
uh, ha have actually integrated data records on vaccinations. And right. because the US has already administered a very large number of vaccinations, pulling together the record uh, across these jurisdictions will be a huge job, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you mentioned New York. New York may be one of the cases that can do this, but there are many others that can't. And to add to that, there are some parts of the country that appear to be against the principle exactly. of having centralized data and uh, vaccination passports. In fact, so, the, the, the President Biden basically said, the administration said they are not for a scheme at a federal level, but they leave the no. private sector and the states to decide what they want to do. Yes, exactly. And this raises some very uh, difficult questions. For example, uh, what happens if you live in a state that is not keen on this idea and makes no right. effort to develop a registry? Right. Um, I can imagine, uh, we, we wrote a short piece on what we call the light touch. What would a light touch vaccination certificate mean uh, issued by states with the minimum amount of information? Mm. Um, it would perhaps not even be tied to presenting a picture ID since a considerable part of the US population does not have a picture ID, an official picture right. ID. Just basically name, date of birth, vaccination details, that's it, verified against the local registry. My guess is that is as far as we can expect the situation to go and it will be patchy. Okay. Okay, so let's switch gears. Um, obviously, there's a lot of controversy around this. A lot of people criticize them from ethical and also from legal points of view. I'd, I'd like to go back to you, Edgar, and then I'll go to Derek, Florian, and Alan to talk about what do you see the ethical concerns that these things raise? Okay, so we've already seen, particularly in, in, in the... Uh, chat discussion, the practical concerns of where you get your verified uh, data from, whether we're going to have national registries of approved vaccination centers, approved test centers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think the other really interesting potential threat is was hinted at uh, by Alan, which says that if you've got this technology or that has been sorted out, it's been integrated with apps, you've got verification apps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What's to stop this being used for other health data over and above COVID related vaccination test uh, antibody uh, data? If you've if got- the data is minimized, Edgar, if the data is minimized and all, it, all there is is just that I no, got no, vaccinated. But, but if you, if, I'm saying if you've got the, the infrastructure to share right. minimized data for, right. to a what trusted prevents? third party, then- right you will see pressures to introduce that same model right. for other kinds of data. Right. We will talk about your propensity for heart disease, your propensity for, for alcoholism, your propensity for depression, your propensity right. to sickle cell disease, a whole series of other perfectly legitimate, it's good for the other side to know about this health kind of data. And so there's a real risk that this model that we've developed for one particular disease at one particular time opens up that uh, infrastructure that then says, well, we'll allow all sorts of different health related data to be shared mm -hmm. in a privacy preserving, et cetera, et cetera, mechanism, but potentially also then leading to all sorts of uh, unintended, hopefully unintended, but still mm -hmm. consequential discrimination. Slippery, slippery slope, we're, we're seeing the potential for that. Okay, um, Derek, what do you think should we be worried about with these schemes? Bring, bring an Africa perspective, perhaps. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, uh, Dr. Tick. This is a very important uh, subject. Um, and at the same time, it's a, it's a subject that normally goes without saying, but goes without doing, you know, at the same time. Um, it's, um, I think, been noted, especially on the African continent, that uh, the question of data sovereignty has been a big discussion. Uh, in recent times, we have had you know, discussions around um, data ownership. Should this be in the cloud? Should this be on the ground? And, and, and the challenge there has been historically that uh, most innovators have tended to keep the data outside the boundaries of that particular state. And that has created issues uh, like uh, you know, has been spoken around uh, privacy concerns 
we've had situations where entire databases are actually stored outside the country. And so issues around um, you know, making sure that that technology know-how is built within local clouds, for example, uh, it, it has to be recognized that uh, you know, governments in, on the African continent, especially within the spectrum of e-government, have been building this capacity around uh, you know, uh, local clouds that are managed by the ministries of ICT. And, and so that realization needs to be caused because they're still thinking that, you know, this data must be, must be stored somewhere in the cloud. And, 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 and that creates an issue because as far as patients are concerned, uh, generally, when a, when a patient goes to the facility, the transaction between the patient and that facility is what is sustained. The patient believes he is where I'm keeping the records, but has no notion that this data is actually, you know, being transmitted. And so that's been a big concern. There's been situations where, you know, um, the digital solutions that once used to run in the cloud have been required to run on the ground by certain member states for good reasons, of course. And right. so the key issue, I think, for the African, you know, a, a, a setting is to recognize that capacity seems to be growing and has been growing uh, around uh, the issue of data governance. And we have to really encourage member states to march towards that, the, the, that direction. Issues around capacity, making sure that uh, there is enough capacity in terms of knowing what is actually meant by data governance, data sovereignty, and issues of data protection. Those kinds of issues must continue to be articulated uh, with member states so that there's that ownership for the process and also participation on an equal ground. So I, mean, I, I think it's a key issue that we need to address and it's an important area, especially for the subject that we're discussing now. I hear you, but let, let, me, let me paint a, a slightly different picture. Let's say the world has moved in a direction where basically international um, destinations have basically started imposing vaccination because there's enough density of people vaccinated. And they basically say, yeah, yeah, we know that who the World Health Organization is not specifying this um, for this purpose. But in fact, we are the ones who are sovereign. We are the ones who are going to use this to de decide on the risk profile. And we are going to accept only people who have been vaccinated to cross our borders. What does that mean to a continent like, like Africa, where we don't see vaccination in, 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 in deep, deep numbers uh, before a couple of years. I mean, and this is a question, this is a question for all of you. Um, is there an inequity? Is there an apartheid that is happening by de facto? Because by the fact we're heading towards a regime by our zeal, by our enthusiasm to get something on, some countries are going to contribute to an apartheid. How do we prevent that? I mean, am I being alarmist or or in fact, this is a real possibility and what do we do about it? I can pick off with that, uh, Dr. Atik, very important point. Uh, so uh, once again, separating the issues, I think Nat's discussion is important, really separating the issues that uh, the, the, the primary focus around uh, continuity of care and recording events must be our lens initially. And then secondly, recognizing initiatives. I mean, this, is, this topic is catalytic in a number of ways. It's not really about COVID, but infrastructure. I mean, what Africa CDC and the EU are doing is, is something that needs to be recognized because they're building infrastructure that is managed by governments to ensure cross-border transactions. And before this, we had the Eastern African member states uh, building, you know, amongst the six member states, uh, a connected environment because in East Africa, the borders are porous, like people have mentioned. Yeah. And to address that, those member states have built, or at least are building this uh, on the ground data center to support those post-border transactions, not only for health, but employment as well. So right. this capacity is what I was speaking to, that it exists and we have to really build on this particular infrastructure, but keeping in mind that the use cases that we're going to add on this, uh, on this particular infrastructure must keep in mind the issue of patient privacy because infrastructure would exist, but it's how we use the infrastructure and so the ethical considerations around making sure that we're not exporting more than the minimum data set across the border is, is mm -hmm. what we need to emphasize on. But otherwise, I think that there's enough momentum to create a connected space. And as you mentioned, Dr. Atik, when it comes to interchange between regional bodies, um, getting the infrastructure right is a prerequisite so that you can have this uh, inter-regional, you know, African Union versus e e EU inter in integration would be enabled once you have these fundamental pillars on board around connectivity, making sure that member states have enough governance over their processes. 
Okay. Um, Florian, give me your perspective. Where is IOM worried about here? What, what, what should we be thinking about? So IOM is, is uh, let's say that the worry is that uh, when, when introducing new measures uh, such as uh, um, vaccination, passports and so that many migrants are left out of the scheme that they don't right. have effective access. So I think you know, that, that is a concern and one has to think about uh, how to make sure that, you know, there was a question before in the chat, what about people who have to flee, who don't have any documentation themselves? So there must be also specific pathways available for those people. On the other hand, you know, I want to bring in also um, maybe one idea or one, one thing is that, you know, digital solutions can also be, um, you know, can also be um, a solution yeah, for uh, especially also uh, the situation of um, people who, who otherwise don't have very strong um, um, legal identity registered. And you know, so we should also look at you know, the opportunity. So I don't want to blink, uh, have a whole black uh, negative picture where we say, you know, this is, uh, this is only negative. It, we have to think and have to think how to introduce these solutions so that when it comes to cross-border mobility to international migration, that these new solutions can also work for uh, nationals from countries uh, who would otherwise uh, be left up. up. So, you know, and I think that that's maybe a specific challenge. So it's not enough to introduce such a passport. If, 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 a, if a country requires that, then you have to have in effect also uh, solutions so that not just uh, the business travelers and the wealthy and the, the tourists can travel, but that is also possible for others. And I think you know, that comes, that's a special obligation uh, that but comes from no. Florian, I, I like what you're saying, but I'm going to give you not a hypothetical situation. I'm going to give you a real country situation. I will not mention the country, but I will mention that an individual carrying a U.S. passport um, in a, in a, at the border of a certain country was turned down entry of that country because the officer on the ground basically said, we need vaccination certificate, we need vaccination proof, or else we're not going to let you pass. Um, this was a transit situation. And how do you prevent such a thing from happening? This person had no recourse. There's no international body. The countries are sovereign. If you build it, they will use it. Before that, before the vaccine uh, certificates were available or where proof of vaccination was available, they could not use that excuse. Now, if you build it, they will use it. So what is IOM, can, what can IOM do to prevent such situation from happening? So, you know, I, I think you know, this, this situation is happening. I mean, I, I, I now live in Switzerland. I recently went back to my home country, Germany, and I have to, to go, I have to have a, a test certificate to visit my mother. So, you know, and that, that's a, a three hour drive or like a, by car, and, but I have to carry that test certificate. So I think, you know, you describe a reality. You know, what we describe also in this new report that come out, we, we have to, uh, we have to come to, better international coordination. I think, you know, when you look at the situation as it is now, we, we, in the first phase of this pandemic, it was a total lockdown. All of a sudden you couldn't even cross borders. I mean, they, right. you know, they, it was a total lockdown. So now we're getting into a phase where, yes, some, there, there's some experimentation with, you know, with new tools. And, um, you know, IOM's role, I think, in this is that, you know, we, we participate in these working groups, like the one in, uh, with, with experts run by WHO and by ICAO, bring in our expertise. Member states in the end will decide on what they want to do. Also within the UN, it's member states in the end that decide on new standards. But I think, you know, overall, when you think about a global situation, it will be the United Nations that hopefully can bring on certain standards. I mean, you know, and, and, and make sure that, that they're evidence-based, that they do not exclude uh, 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 from the beginning certain groups, but that they have uh, special provisions of uh, more vulnerable groups, that they also have a plan B, you know, if, if they don't uh, comply with all the requirements on plan A, that they have a what plan happens? to go through it, that they have proper legal recourse. I mean, that's then more on the, on the, on the national level. Right. But you know, I think it's, the, and that's maybe, I just want to draw the attention, that's in this report we just launched today and which we have posted in the chat, uh, you know, it looks at some of those uh, topics, and uh, I think it's a call for more international cooperation. But, uh, 
I also want to see, you know, and I, I've seen this in many of my visits uh, going to developing countries, also on the African continent, that uh, those technical solutions we're discussing, if properly configured, if probably with a proper policy behind it, well thought through, they can also be uh, solutions to the problem. Right. To the problem. Because we have seen yeah. in, you know, in the current crisis when nothing was done, the borders actually were locked. Right. Okay, Florian, hang in there. Um, Alan, uh, sum up, sum up yeah. the, 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 the ethical consider, uh, concern you mentioned while I ask the operator to bring the others because there's a, a lot of questions coming in. And also I want to discuss the trust frameworks because people are, are wondering about why there are several different approaches. So operator, bring in the, the rest of the panel on while Alan will sum up our, uh, what he sees are the ethical concerns. Thank you, Joseph. Um, you know, as we've, as we've looked at the way in which ID systems have um, evolved and worked in developing countries, I think we see two big categories of risk. Well, actually three. Uh, the one relates to privacy, mission creep, intrusion, uh, surveillance. Uh, the second one relates to exclusion. It relates to the, uh, the, the role of the system in excluding people. And then, of course, there's a third risk, which is waste of money. So we'll leave that one on the side. Um, in terms of the exclusion, let me talk a little bit about this. Um, I think this is a case that we need to think through very carefully because we need to take a user journey. We need to think of an individual who is in a situation and the kind of conditions and barriers that they face. They have to have access to a vaccine if it's a vaccine credential. Uh, there needs to be a suitable electronic infrastructure for the registration of that vaccination. Uh, in some countries, there have been measures to tie vaccination credentials to ID system, to IDs. That is potentially exclusionary. And I think it's interesting that India, for example, does not insist on ADA to get a oh. vaccination. You can have a variety of credentials. And in the mm. last resort, in some countries, you want to issue the vaccination certificate without that. Just name, date of birth. Uh, it has to be easy to get. It has to be practical easy to download. You don't have to go back and get a separate document. And I think for all of these reasons, um, we're going to see that a lot of people won't have them. And that means that we can't see them as uh, yes and no answers. We can't see them as something that you have to have. Um, we can see them as facilitating mm -hmm. various things, whether it's international travel or perhaps certain domestic things. And we need to understand what the exception handling protocols are, because for quite a long time, there are going to be at least as many exceptions as there are holders, right? So we have to get that right. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the main messages I think we need to uh, do. And I, think, I hope internationally, this was discussed in some of the earlier sessions, right? That this was right. part of a risk strategy, rather than saying yes, no. I think that is terribly important. Okay. So it's part of a risk strategy, not a yes, no. It not doesn't a yes, no. create privilege and lack of privilege. It's a multi-factor risk assessment that needs to take place. Indeed. Okay, um, very good, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to bring Dr. Karen and Raj back again. Um, a lot of people are wondering about the, the, the trust framework. You, you, you talked about PKI and PKD platforms as being used to ensure that the, 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 the certification is authentic, et cetera. Can either one of you walk us through the chain of trust from the vaccination point to the point of verification of the credential itself or, or, the, or, or the seal itself? Because there are multiple elements of this. Either one of you, uh, whoever feels more comfortable, I know both of you are working on it, um, Thanks yeah. to Rajesh because he's uh, he's prepared it and written it, so I'll fill okay. in anything so, at the end. So, so Rajesh, walk us through the chain of trust. I am Joseph Arik. I'm getting vaccinated right now. What happens? Yeah. So fundamentally, um, first thing I want to say is that what we are specifying is a companion document for travel, right? So it's purely for cross-border uh, uh, crossings. So the way it is envisaged is you get your vaccination, you don't need to get that certificate at that point of time itself. You need to get it before you travel. Similar to how we do with uh, the yellow fever card right now. I mean, I have a yellow fever card and uh, I lost it. I keep getting it reissued and all that kind of stuff. 
but that is something that I do after the fact uh, when I need to travel. So you do that at that point of time, there has to be some agency within the organize within the country that is able to create a digitally signed QR code and put it either mm -hmm. on a piece of paper or hand it to you as an image that you can carry on your mobile phone. It is signed by a barcode signer, which comes from the root of trust within the country itself. So you need to have a root of trust within the country. And that root of trust needs to be distributed to all the other receiving countries so that they are able to verify the document that you have issued. But Raj, one second. Yes. When we sure. talked about electronic passports, we understood yes. who's responsible for that root of trust. Right. When, when we are talking about this, like come back to the US, who yes. is going to be the root <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very valid problem. And it's a, it's a question that we've been grappling with. And it's, I'm aware of at least six countries uh, where I'm having discussions where they started off saying that the Ministry of Health or some equivalent would be the root of trust. So they wanted to set up their own CA as a root of trust. And then they went to the travel document issuing authority in that same country and said, can you create a barcode signer for us so that we have a single root of trust from that country? Because that mm -hmm. root of trust is already trusted globally by everybody who's receiving your passport. So in doing the specifications, we created a profile that allows you to differentiate that this is a health proof signer and this is a travel document signer to cater for that kind of a scenario, right? But you are right, there are some countries that are going to have parallel routes of trust and we allow for that as well in the- And, and none, maybe, maybe they will also say no. I mean, this is yeah. a private, private issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the airlines should deal with it. Um, yeah. I mean, Louise, you can step in at any point and tell me <laughs> what happens. Will I ever travel again? I mean, I'm stuck here in New York. I want to be able to go back to Europe. Will I ever be accepted? I've gotten vaccinated. Thank mm. you. But will I ever travel again? I hope so. Uh, and, and I hope so soon. I mean, we've got uh, three airlines currently live with IATA Travel Pass and we go live on the App Store and uh, T minus seven days. It's very busy here right now. And, and there's, um, I think, 17 airlines trialling in April. Uh, that increases to 30 in, um, in May. And I, I think there's 50 in the queue. So just to give an idea, yes, you will travel again. Okay. Uh, I'd reiterate again, we do not, and we completely support the host position that vaccination should not be a requirement for travel, but, but the equity issues, uh, are, it's, it's, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, an option from our perspective. Um, what I will come back to, and I know it's a, it's a fraught issue having, uh, and just looking at the difficulty of uh, the adoption of e-passports and knowing the difficulty in a centralised PKI system. And that uh, is, I mean, the, the, the e-passport is an incredible document with incredible global interoperability, really high security. And I applaud the, the, the work that's been done in that area. However, for the, the scalability and the speed at which we need to move, um, there are other solutions out there. Uh, we will certainly from, it's not, uh, it's not IATA's role to determine this. Uh, uh, for obvious reasons, we'd like no requirements at borders, um, but that, that we also want safe resumption of travel. We can ab absorb whether it's the WHO Smart Vaccination Certificate or the ICAO PKD certificate that that's able to be incorporated just like we incorporate the passport for the digital the digital passport the digital identity component in the app. What um, we can also do is have the health authorities who do not have access to that root certificate an opportunity to inject the vaccination uh, certificate directly into our to travel pass so that it can be used and it can be verified. Our concern mm -hmm. is being able to access the verifiable data registry, which is an issue with the ICAO um, proposition right. currently. Without putting you on the spot, um, do you think starting in April, middle of April, the IATA application will access the, let's say, the New York State registry of, of, uh, of, reg of vaccinated people to validate that indeed I had received the registration or do you think it's too early? I, I think it's uh, I think it's too early when it comes to the US. It's a very very hot topic. Uh, the conversations are happening, um, our, our, and uh, it's it's not impossible. I mean, what what underlies all of this in the trust framework is access to the to the verifiable uh, source, the access to the public information, exactly. and um, to yeah. be able to do that. And and the option is always there for direct issuance into products such as IATA Travel Pass. 
Right. Ra Raj, you have something to say. Please continue. Yes, I, I, this has been repeated a few times, and I want to clarify this once and for all. The EMRTD PKI is not a centralized PKI. It is a decentralized PKI. Anybody can verify that passport as long as they have the root of trust of that country. The IKO PKD is a distribution mechanism that brings efficiency to that process. It is not a centralized PKI, and Luis knows this very well, but keeps repeating this in every meeting that she attends, right? And I am a little unhappy with that. And uh, let, me, let me finish, Luis, right? Uh, the other issue that I have here is that a receiving country depends on the other country, a sovereign country being the root of trust, right? And that is going to be a requirement I expect that most countries and most borders will have. So any solution that is built will have to take the country, a sovereign country as the issuing authority of that credential to be able to trust it, right? And that model already works well in the e-passport world and we are transporting it there and it is not a centralized PKI, it is decentralized. Anyone can get those certificates and verify those passports. Similarly, anyone should be able to verify their health credentials as well. Certain, certainly uh, having access to be able to verify against that single source of truth and either in the IKO master list, both for passports and for uh, any, any uh, VDS issued certificates. Uh, currently it is only, in, and even uh, in speaking before Rajesh, country to country, uh, it's member states who have access uh, and industry does not have access. Uh, Kieran's got his hand up there. Uh, actually, I set up the IQ PKD. I know everyone has access. And the IQ I'm, PKD should be uh, anonymously downloadable as written in the specifications that I wrote in DOC 9303. <laughs> Right. I think you didn't write the legal terms and conditions, uh, which I did. legally forbid us from downloading. Very interestingly, I wrote that specific that, uh, terms Excellent. and conditions on that website, right? So I know it can be done, and that has to be an offline discussion, but I don't <laughs> think that should be repeated again in public discussions like this, uh, but it cannot be validated by others. Well, Can I, I mean, jump, clearly... jump in mom momentarily, Joseph, just, just to clarify yes. Yes, that yes, there, yes. Are, there are some terms and conditions, but I would emphasize that the IKO master list is not the only piece of the picture as well. Um, you know, Louise Rajesh knows that there are other master lists that are out there that, that are usable. It's a decentralized PKI, and that's why that any entity that's part of the picture can issue master lists, can, can share their certificates. And I would like to just address one point. I think Rajesh has dealt with the issuance process and the importance of, you know, the chain of trust in the issuance mm. there. But Louise did mention that the, the security of the passport is very strong, which I think we all agree with. And maybe we, we, we don't need something of great strength. Again, mm. I would, I would uh, caution against that theory because the trust depends on two things. And I've said it in the chat questions. It's on the trust in the issuance, but it's also mm. the trust in the authenticity and the integrity of the document that's being presented, which is what the passport and the digital signature achieves. So if we diminish the level of security in the document, we are losing something. And considering that we have 140 plus countries already issuing a very, very secure document and we can build off that, mm. to me, that's a more sensible starting point than saying, well, let's accept something of more limited security in the documents uh, that they might be able to build quickly, but we actually have 13 or 15 years of experience to get to 140 plus countries building something very, very secure. So where possible and sensible uh, to leverage that to make sure that we have both the trust in the issuance and the trust in the actual credential that's presented uh, whenever okay. it's presented in the travel continuum uh, as well. So, I mean, you made an important point. The trust is not just in the document itself, but the chain. I'm worried about the chain of trust because the access to the verifiable information, as Luis has said, as Luis has said, is not necessarily there. I think we need to work with the countries to help us validate that the laboratories that are testing are actually legit, um, being able to validate that they are just like we do with, with the chain of trust for breeder documents in, in, in birth certificates, we're able to go in and the civil registration becomes part of the proof for identity, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the, the question is not that simple. The question is not that simple, but I wanna, I wanna highlight the fact that there has been several variants of it. There's the PKD of IKO flavor, but uh, Derek, can you address this issue? And then I'll come back to Edgar. Can, can you address this issue is, um, the trust framework by WHO similar to IKO or you've taken a different approach? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, 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 Dr. Atik. Um, as Nat mentioned, uh, the trust framework from IQ uh, uh, has been instrumental in forming the uh, trust framework for WHO. So it's really built on that and it's written in the specification that would encourage members to read uh, for comment, we've actually specified it that way as this is really like the backbone. However, the keys will be maintained by WHO. So sort of like uh, imitating the business model for that particular trust framework, but really getting uh, WHO as a broker. So that's basically is how that is built. But that's a problem, no? Because you've got now two sets of, um, two sets of certificates and, and what if the framework of the certificates are different? You're gonna require the points of access of the borders to have to read two different types I mean, do, do you have concerns, uh, Kieran, Dr. Kieran, about that? Um, to, to answer quickly, there's not an immediate concern. Um, I think it's important that uh, ICAO and WHO work together and with sister UN organizations. So it's natural that we do so. And I think bet between us here and to everybody, that's the, the natural path forward. What's uh, critical is not where the certificates are stored or who the broker is the decentralized as Rajesh explained. What is fundamentally as important is that the profile that's used, uh, the format, should I describe mm -hmm. it as that, of the certificates follows that that's already defined by ICAO so that mm -hmm. when something is presented at a border, uh, the infrastructure knows how the type of certificate that will be uh, utilized in the context of that BKI, whether they get that certificate from ICAO or they get that certificate from the WHO or they get it from another master list is, mm. is not the foremost question. It's that it all works together. And as long as okay. the profile is followed, that should be the case. Okay. Uh, one last thing about the trust framework. As you know, many of the private initiatives are based on blockchain. There's a lot of blockchain proposals that we've received. The New York uh, system, which is based on the IBM Health Pass, is based on blockchain. Jeremy, if you if you care to comment, or anybody else, um, Edgar, um, Raj, about do you see blockchain having a role to play in the trust framework here? And if yes, why? I'll, I'll go if, if nobody else wants to go. Uh, I yeah. can, I, to, to me, the, the really interesting part of the blockchain solutions is the, 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 the data formats around the verified credentials, the kind of knowing what the data is and where it comes from, right. where you happen to store it, to me, is, is much less incidental. Okay. I wouldn't be rushing to stick it onto a blockchain at scale for a global uh, pandemic, but that's a, a personal preference. Just while I've got the floor, I just want to just flag up that when we've been talking about trust frameworks, the conversation has become quite detailed about PKI chains. Mm -hmm. Trust frameworks can also be seen as much broader, highlighting things like recourse, the appropriate rules, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, if you want people to trust these credentials, you also want a set of rules about what can be done with your sensitive, minimally disclosed health data that is being shared with third parties. Now we have reasonable rules for border control about what data can be collected, but if you start to use this in other situations, then certainly a different notion of trust oh, framework sure. needs to start thinking about those kinds of considerations over and above just the technical, who's uh, got the, 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 the root uh, certificate for the okay. signing of uh, credentials. Okay, I, we wanna close here, but before I close, I'd like to ask if any of the panelists has um, a final word that they wanna share, uh, something that they have not shared before. So please raise your hand and we'll give you the floor before we close. Um, we thank everybody for sticking with us this long. Nat uh, from WHO was not able to stay, so she had to go, of course, Derek is here. Um, so anybody um, on the floor, on the panel, would like to say any closing words from your side. Um, clearly, this has been a very, very intense session. Two and a half hours passed very quickly. Um, but we clearly see that the issues are far, far from being really resolved. There are still open questions. I apologize deeply. We haven't taken community voices and we haven't taken a lot of the questions. It's just there's so much intensity. Mm -hmm. I promise we will come back to this topic at a later date this year when some clarity has, has taken place and then we can reassess 
what what has happened and what turned out to be right on and what turned out to be off the wall. So any uh, uh, anybody? Dr. Ashley, if, I, if I may, um, yes, I, please. I think my my one observation, and obviously, you know, I think really good, really good discussion, really interesting debate. I think for me, though, it's very clear that we're going to have a number of many different solutions around for quite some time, and therefore that question of interoperability, certainly in the short term, is a really critical one. And uh, you know, I think. That's where I think a lot of the focus is. Um, it's great that we've now got some evolving standards coming and uh, ways of working. We're still some way off seeing implementations of those, and uh, but we need to get that interoperability uh, piece working right because you know we're you know whether it's a, a national prosperity and recovery required or a, an industry uh, recovery required, we uh, we do need to uh, move out of the uh, pandemic situation quickly. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, anybody else wants to say a final word, or we should just say thank you? Oh, I think I think I'd like to echo Jeremy, but also to really focus the. This is uh, really transformative. This kind of collaboration at an international level. I think we need to sort of like continue maintaining the momentum. Uh, this is, I think, one accidental benefit of the pandemic. I mean, it's been quite a disaster, but we're able to now have organizations working together and fit for purpose solutions is what we really need to be focused on and making sure that as Jeremy mentioned, nailing down interoperability for the future for scale is yeah. a critical aspect for us to succeed, to succeed at. And, Thanks a lot. And, and we, we, we're, we're very happy to continue. Our name is ID for Africa, but in fact, we're doing ID for D globally and ID for economy, ID for anything. Um, so with us today have been people from 140 different countries in the world. Clearly, we care about the countries that are that are risk, at risk of being left behind in Africa because they have to comply with what's happening. Their capacity building needs to be reinforced. The knowledge transfer needs to be affected. So we'll continue to be very, very active. We appreciate all the panelists for having uh, spend the time with us. I know most webinars in the world are, are one hour and then you go home. This is not a webinar. This is an event. This is an experience. We start to collaborate uh, real time in front of everybody. So um, this is the end. So thank you everybody of this part. Part two and part three are going to be very, very different. They're not going to be a debate sessions. They're going to be essentially a survey of innovations. We've went through the process and selected some innovations that might be interesting. Um, so uh, come back to that session on the 29th of April and see what ideas at national level and what ideas from the private sector um, are, are now floating around that could support the policy discussions that we've had here. And for, with that in mind, I say thank you, have a good day and stay safe. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.